Then honoring Tony Bennett, an emotional sit down with the legendary singer's wife and son in their first interview since his passing. He didn't just light up a room, he just loved the room, you know. He just uh, was all love, all love, all the time. They will open up about his life and legacy and how they are paying tribute on what would have been Bennett's 97th birthday. And the dinner party. My, 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 my turn, my, 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 my turn. Cast members from the office getting ready to reunite and sit down for dinner with a lucky fan. How you can enter to win a seat at the table and the good cause behind it. Today, Thursday, August 3rd, 2023. <laughs> And Jackson, Mississippi. Mississippi! On a girl's trip from St. Louis! Today's my sweet 16. Travel from Raleigh, North Carolina. Johnston, Iowa. Athens, Georgia. Arlington, Virginia. And Fargo, North Dakota. Three generations from Philly and Harrisonburg, Virginia. To the Today Show. Hi to my mom watching back in Elton, Louisiana. We love you, Nora. Birthday. Oh my God. Mm, we're back 810 celebrating the life of music icon Tony Bennett. Today would have been his 97th birthday. So in honor of his birthday, I had the chance to speak to Susan Benedetto. That's his devoted partner of 38 years and his eldest son, Danny. It was their first interview since Tony's passing. We spoke about his incredible career and the love he had for everyone and also some beautiful moments of Tony's final days. He didn't just light up a room, he just loved the room, you know. He just uh, was all love, all love, all the time. I mean, he said it to the day he died, you know, it's, it's, it's all about love. And all about love is how most anyone who crossed paths with legendary singer Tony Bennett would feel after being in his presence. But Susan Benedetto, Tony's partner of 38 years and Tony's eldest son, Danny Bennett, got to live and breathe it every day. I mean, it seems like he's the guy who kept giving gifts. Did he ever yep. get tired of... Never. Nope. Never. Wait, Tony <laughs> loved being a public person. He loved yeah. being an entertainer. And, you know, he really believed when, when he said, I'm in the business of making people feel good. And he felt that was a very noble thing. Susan met Tony at one of his concerts in 1985. She says their connection was instant. She went as a fan of his music and left having met her perfect match. They eventually married in 2007. Susan shared these private photos with us that capture the joy and devotion of their partnership. Why do you think your relationship spanned all those years? You know, he performed to everybody. He never saw generation gaps or anything and so and privately we didn't either you know we just absolutely loved each other and uh, he was my life Danny to be Tony Bennett's son has to be first of all an amazing experience how would you describe it he was just the man of the man of the people and so we experienced that as as kids and as we're seeing with this amazing outpouring uh, it's coming from every sector whether it's music or art or or you know the cab driver on the street and you know the hot dog it was an amazing journey Danny also had an amazing journey as Tony's manager. Together, they introduced Tony to a new audience, starting with the MTV generation of the 90s. And with MTV, he came into my office one time. He said, I was watching MTV. He goes, I think I can do that, and then walked out. And I was like, <laughs> all right. And he was still making connections with new audiences, winning his 20th and final Grammy for an album with close friend Lady Gaga. When Lady Gaga obviously got his, his final Grammy with Lady Gaga, mm -hmm. what did you think of that relationship, Susan? Well, I mean, I think it was a tremendous gift to each of them. Yeah. I loved it. And the fact that she could help him to really ride out his career in, in such a great way. A career that never slowed down, even after being diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease in 2016. Did he know, like, explain what he knew about his illness? He really never did. When, you know, when he was diagnosed, uh, you know, Danny and I thought, you know, this is going to be it. He's going to have to slow down, you know. Yeah. And, but Tony's like, I don't know what you're talking about, you know. 
I want to keep singing. And we take and, him to the doctor, and he'd go, well, "What am I? What yeah, am I here?" Yeah, he, we would leave until he's like, "Susan, I'm really okay. You don't have to come back." <laughs> so even though you forget a lot with Alzheimer's, he remembered the songs. He could do that. It's amazing. He could do the songs. Um, <laughs> the, last, this, <laughs> uh, the week before he passed away, not was, even just was, a couple days. Yeah, yeah. I think he was singing. singing. He sang because of you. We were getting him up to exercise, mm -hmm. uh -huh. and so it was easy to just latch onto the piano. And I said, tell him, why don't you get up and you can sing, you know, any excuse to just get him up. Yeah. And he's like, I said, why don't you sing? He's like, what do you want to hear? I said, how about singing because of you? So he sang because of you. Because of you, there's a song in my heart. That was the last song he sang? Yeah, literally, that was the last song he sang, yeah. What does that moment mean to you now, Susan? Well, of course, it bookends his career, if you think just musically speaking. That was his first hit, and then that was literally just the last song that he sang. But the music never left him. Right. And when he did have more alert moments, or like first thing in the morning, he didn't ask really about anyone or anything, except, am I working tonight? That's really, and the other day, he's like, Susan, am I in a good theater tonight? You know, it's like something like that. And the week before, one of the aides, lovely, young Ukrainian man. So he, I was teaching him a little about tone and stuff. And, and uh, so we were watching YouTube, and Tony was alert enough that he's like watching it. And he said, um, was I always popular? And I said, yes, sweetheart. I said, you were, I said, you've been popular for over 70 years. And he said, that's because I stayed with quality. Stayed, stayed with, with quality. quality. Did he remember you? He did. Thank goodness, yes. <sighs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Danny, did he remember you yeah, too? He, yeah, he did. Uh, His last no, words did. to me was, thank you. Yeah. Can't say it better than that. What was the last thing he said to you, Susan? Do you remember? That, that he loved me. Hmm. Yeah. So I mean, we would he would wake up every day and 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 still say that. Yeah. You know, he woke up happy every day, even if he had had a bad day or not. You know, he didn't remember it. That was the only blessing. And yeah, he woke up happy, and he's just like Susan. You're the best thing that ever happened to me. And but he would say all the time. How do you think he? Susan would like to be remembered. You know, he didn't want to be remembered as the best, and he just really wanted to be remembered as a nice person. And and I think all the outpouring of love from people that we that we know and love and complete strangers mm. has proven that. Yeah, yeah. People feel like they've lost a family friend, even if they never met him. And you know, when he sang, he truly believed what he was singing. What did you lose the day Tony died? Well, I mean. The obvious thing is to say everything. I lost my North Star, but you know, no, no reason to feel bad for me though, because my life has been wonderful, and uh, you know, I'll find a way to make sure it stays that way. It'll just be different forever. And I can smile because. I I mean, yeah. talk about like a life well lived. And just sitting and visiting with them, they told me all about how he was in World War II. Mm -hmm. He was there when John F. Kennedy gave a speech. He marched with Martin Luther King. He sang with all of these greats from Judy Garland all the way to Gaga. Yeah. Like what a life well lived. Uh, and I just thought how beautiful, how beautiful. It really is yeah. beautiful. Yeah. And that, you know, it's like he is remembered as the greatest and he's remembered as a nice person. Yes, yeah. to have both yes. things. Every yeah. time he was here on the show. Just, yeah, he was just here. so lovely. Wasn't he? And he would have been here today. It's certainly 97. We'd have yeah. a cake of for him. Yeah. Exactly. Pain and of course. And he would sing because of you or whatever. Yeah, yeah. of course. We're thinking about him today. Yeah, you really yeah. do. You always see that sparkle. Yeah, light that's right. In his the eyes. eyes. His yeah. eyes. Well, it's, uh, watching his son, you feel like his son could almost. Isn't he wanted that, to carry on the you hear that voice. Voice. legacy. He could go and perform. Yeah. Yes. Wow. Sounds right. just like him. Yeah. Sweet. Cool. All right.
back with back to school savings. In the weeks ahead, millions of students are starting to head back to college and of course, Tuition is just one of the costs that every parent has to consider and every student. Everyday living expenses can be major obstacles on the road to a degree. So how can you help your older kids learn to budget? Well, Vicki is here with some tips and some way to cut costs as well. So Vicki, welcome. Okay, so first of all, it is important to have a budget. So your, your kids should know how, how that works. 100% okay. Hoda. Financial experts would say do not set foot on a college campus without a budget. Okay. And that starts with pen and paper and just write down every single thing you can think that you may be spending money on. There are the big things like housing and food, transportation costs. How often are you going to go home to see your family? You might want to uh, build in gas money or airfare and also laundry, little things that you might not think about. The other thing that's going to help you with that is um, apps, right? Mm -hmm. Like there's one called Mint. A lot of people are familiar with Mint. It mm -hmm. will help you look at your bank account and look at the items that you need to spend money on. Mm -hmm. Another one you may not have heard of, it's called YNAB and it okay. stands for you need a budget. The cool thing about you this, need, wait, that's perfect. You need a budget, easy. right? Yeah. It follows this zero-based budgeting program where you're basically giving every single dollar in your bank account a job. You're this goes it. towards takeout. Yep. This goes towards my Brilliant. savings. And the first year is free for college students. All right, let's talk about essentials because yeah. there are things every college student needs: books, computers, the works. Hoda, just a couple days ago we talked about this. It's yes. just like buying a car. If you buy a used electronics, a laptop, a computer, a phone, it is actually going to be a lot more beneficial to you and a lot more budget friendly. Mm -hmm. There are the sites you've heard of. eBay is one. Swappa, Back Market, Best Buy, Amazon. Big retailers often have refurbished items. Mm -hmm. And don't forget about trading in the computer that you have already or the iPad or the phone. CNET Smart. recommends something called Declutter. They also recommend uh, an app called It's Worth More. They'll sell you the money or Venmo you the money so you get it back very quickly if you're trying to upgrade a device. And then this is one of my favorite tips, Hoda. Oh, There's a website called ID.me. ID .me. They offer discounts for all kinds of people, our military, our first responders, doctors and nurses, but students, your .edu or your student ID is a gateway to a lot so of savings. you punch that information in and you'll find the savings available to you exactly. right there? Exactly. I checked. They had deals from Samsung, from Bose, on clothing, okay. on food, ID. This is very important. Housing. Usually yes. you think first year I'm in the dorms, but then what? So what's your suggestion? Right. Well, typically it is cheaper to live off campus, but for many first year off students, campus, it's colleges cheaper. want you on campus. It's not even a choice. Yeah. They they require you to live on campus yeah. because it's safer, it's a safer yeah. transition, a little bit more controlled environment. But let's say you are going to get to live off campus. When you start planning for that, don't forget, you're now on the hook for your water, your trash, your electricity, your cable, your all of those yeah. bills, your food, your groceries. The good thing is you can split bills with roommates. That's a great way to save on some of those things. All right, but what, and what if the, I think meal plans are important because the college is offering, but kids don't eat all the meals. Exactly. U.S. Yeah. News and World Reports um, says that on average, a college meal plan costs somewhere around $500 a month for the academic year. Now, it can go a lot higher. Mm -hmm. I would say this. Ask yourself, what kind of student am I? Yeah. Do I wake up every single day and am I planning to have breakfast, lunch, and dinner and stay on campus for weekends? Then get the deluxe meal plan. But if you're like, I kind of sleep in, I'm not really a breakfast person, I'm going to be going home to hang out with my family, then get the small plan. You can always so you, add oh, on. I didn't know you could customize, so you, you can. You can generally. Usually okay. it's pretty flexible and it's easier to add on than to get rid of at the end of the year. This is one of my favorite hacks. There's a website called Budget Bites, and they teach you how to use things like a coffee maker to make boiled eggs in your dorm room. Two words for you, Hoda. Convection what? microwave. Wait, what? Apparently, that's the device that you should have. <laughs> I don't in your even know what that is. Exactly. Look it up. So it's like a convection oven and a microwave yeah. in one. Yeah, thing? it's like an air fryer and a microwave. Okay, you can do you, all kinds of things lastly, and save money that does way. Does your kid need a credit card? If you are going to treat that credit card like cash and pay it off, pay in it off full right away every single month, then the, the finance experts would say yes, get a credit card. It'll help you build your credit history, get a financial, uh, you know, like mm -hmm. record of what you're doing. Sure. And also choose those reward cards so you can earn cash back, earn miles towards something. And what's cool is every month you get a monthly statement and it tells you, you know, I'm kind of spending a lot on coffee. Yeah. I got a lot of manicures yes. this month. It will give you a picture, a snapshot Break of how down. you're spending your money, which teaches you financial responsibility. So good. Oda. Vicky, brilliant, College brilliant. 101. All right, Vicky, thank you. All right, guys, over to you. All right, thank you. We are catching up with Wolfgang Van Halen. Only on today's show do you go from customizing meal plans to rock and roll. Yes. And we're doing it. Man, at WVH here, brand new album on the way. We're going to get a taste of it. A live performance coming up at first. This is today on NBC.
The City Music Series on today is proudly presented to you by City. Mammoth Chew, Guys. the name Mammoth of the new Chew. record. This is the soft song. Let's hear it. Take it away. I'll be waiting for you. I'll be waiting for you. Can we stay here just a while? Embracing this denial while I'm waiting. I'm waiting for you. For you. That is how you do it in the morning on the Today Show. Mammoth WVH. Uh, Excellent. That has like wedding rock and roll first dance vibes. I mean, I know. That is like what? iconic rock ballad. That just sounds That's like fun. a smash hit. I don't know. You'd be, that'd be pretty lame to have my song be the first dance song. Well, you wouldn't be playing it. You'd be dancing it. The wedding band would come. No, it. other people's weddings. Yeah. Okay, okay. What's your yeah. wedding first song going to be? Andrea, do we know yet? Is it a secret? You don't have to tell. I think so. Oh. You want me to say yeah. In Your Eyes by Peter Gabriel? Oh, that's a very special song. It's either Ed Sheeran or Peter Gabriel. I'm already crying. <laughs> Wait, awesome. speaking of crying, Valerie. Stop it, Hoda! <laughs> How about that song, though, Val? That, like, that's, that should be on every radio station in it's America. Beautiful. It's beautiful. I know, You're right? You're actually crying Hello, right radio now. stations? Yeah. What? You're actually crying. I'm sorry, I love you. There's always high odds when she's here, she's crying. You know that. <laughs> it's the sweetest. Uh, by the way, pick up the new record. It's out tomorrow. We want to thank the fellas here yeah, for waking up and rocking good. out with us, along with Wolfie, of course. And now you guys can take a nap, because that was a, yeah. you've been up all night. But tours wow. this fall. Too, you thought that was great. Check them out on the road. Okay, and more in the third hour Thanks, as well. Thank well, you guys. We, all, we love yeah. having you here. Thank you so Happy much. To okay, let's go outside to Al. Yeah, we got Bobby Clay here. Hey, he's going to answer your weeknight dinner prayers. You got us a nice way to spice up some chicken thighs? Oh, yes, absolutely. All some right. honey, mustard, a whole bunch of uh, good, delicious green stuff. That's coming up, but first, this is today on NBC. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Woo!
are back on the plaza with today's food. This morning, culinary legend Bobby Flay is here sharing a fun and delicious summertime recipe and hearing about the return of his exciting Food Network show, Bobby's Triple Threat. Bobby, good morning. Good morning, Al. Good to good see to you, see my you. friend. So tell us again the idea of Triple Threat. So Triple Threat is uh, I've, 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 uh, I've picked three chefs, uh -huh. Brooke Williamson, Tiffany Derry, Michael Voltaggio, killers in the kitchen. Oh, yeah. And uh, I, I pit them against one amazing chef from somewhere out there in the country. I put $25,000 in cash in a bag, and if they can beat all three of them, they, they take home the money. There's cash in the bag. There's cash in the bag. Wow, I love this. Okay, it's so, just a zipper away. I, woo! <laughs> so this recipe kind of is a throwback to, to one that's starting up. Uh, Exa on the exactly. So basically what happens in the first round, I give the chefs two ingredients. Uh -huh. In the premiere episode, I give them honey and pistachios okay. just to get them going, and then they can make whatever they want. So right. I'm going to make a dish that's a honey mustard glaze uh, chicken thigh uh -huh. grilled, and then I'm going to use the pistachios in a relish mm. with with green olives, some some uh, some green chilies, mm -hmm. some green herbs like mint and cilantro. So everything green, all in the pool. All right. So you right? got you've got a bunch of olives already. Chopped lots of lots of green olives, Sicilian mm -hmm. olives, a lot of fresh mint, and some uh, cilantro. Could some you do scallions. Any, any herbs you want? Yeah, yeah, totally. Basil uh -huh. will work as well. Sure. And then uh, you know I like the I heat, that. so we're going right. to bring in a little jalapenos, yep. some of these beautiful Sicilian pistachios. Ooh. I know you like pistachios. I do. A little olive oil. They're the muscles <laughs> of the nut. World. The muscles of the nut. World. When there you, you go. Them, little little lime juice, salt mm -hmm. and pepper. Just shake that up. Mix this up, mm -hmm. and you can do this, you know, even a day ahead of time. Oh, nice. Okay. Okay. The glaze, right? Honey and mustard. Mm -hmm. It's a it's an oldie but a goodie. It simple. always it absolutely always works. Come you on. can mix that up for okay. me. Okay. Just very very simple. And then I'm gonna use chicken thighs. I, 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 love I, chicken I am thighs. a chicken thigh oh my gosh. fanatic. I just love chicken thighs way more best, than chicken breast. Best cut of the, uh, the chicken. Tons of flavor. There you go. A little salt and pepper. So we're grilling some chicken thighs. Mm -hmm. We want them to get really nice and crusty on one side. So they're boneless, skinless. Exactly right. And then we're gonna we're gonna flip this over. Okay. Okay. You're gonna give that a glaze. Right. Here you go. Okie dokie. Hi, Bobby. Hi. Oh, hi. What are you guys? Well, uh, how's it taste? Hello. <laughs> you forgot we were the here. silent diner. I did. I'm sorry. The you guys, world. the muscle of the nut. I'm world. still trying to figure that out. Well, when you think about, okay, you think about a muscle. I get it. Okay, and the pistachios. Right, like, it's great. There yeah, you go. I've never heard okay. that analogy. <laughs> I like the olives. It's not too olivey. No, very like light. Really if you don't like olives, you might he, like this. Here's the deal with this. Like. It's the chicken has the the sweetness yeah. from the yeah. from the honey, a little tanginess from the mustard, yeah. and then you get the crunchiness from the pistachios and the olives, I like a little that. saltiness. If you if people Very at home simple. look at this, think it oh. might fall flat on the flavor because it looks so light, but it's not. It's packed with flavor. Big flavor. A lot of big flavor. flavor. And I like that you wrap them in, le in lettuce leaves. Yeah, exactly. Lettuce leaves. I mean, you can put in a tortilla if you'd like. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, make a taco. Mm -hmm. But to me, all the flavors in this relish, as Carson was saying, mm -hmm. the olives, the pistachios, uh -huh. all the fresh mint, and all that. What do you got going this summer? As as far as, what, what do you see as the big the big uh, barbecue meal of the summer? The big barbecue meal of the summer? Yeah, what's hot this year? I mean, listen, I think like more and more people. Yeah. Hey. That, that All right. Was that was New York. All right. That was, did you hear that? That was the 855 <laughs> on his way to Toledo. Uh, listen, I, I think more and more people, I mean, I think Carson hit it on the head. People don't want bland food anymore, no matter what meal, uh, what what meal of the day it yeah. is. They want big, big flavor. So you'll see, you're seeing a lot of barbecue sauces with lots of chili peppers in it, mm -hmm. a lot of smokiness to it. You know, they're bringing in a ton of flavor. All right, Bobby. Yeah. Thanks so much. My Everybody, pleasure. thumbs up. Thumbs up. Thumbs Love up. Bobby. Right. Except for the drink choice. Yeah. I always prefer a cold beer when you're here. I'm a well, little disappointed in you, Bobby. No problem. Next time, I, I'll bring you a six pack. I okay. appreciate that. <laughs> Find Bobby's recipe at today.com/food and catch the season premiere of really Bobby's good. Triple Threat. All August 22nd on Food Network and more Bobby to come. He's in our third hour answering your cooking and barbecue questions. But first, your local news and weather. Bye. Yeah.
this morning on the third hour of today. Who's ready for some football? J-E-T-S. Browns, Browns, Browns. The NFL preseason kicking off tonight. From the fans to the biggest trades to the newest Hall of Famers, we're live with all the action. Then, Chef Bobby Flay is here answering your cooking questions. Plus, sleep better this summer. We're going to help you stay cool while you catch those Z's. And behind the brand of a company with some pretty sweet success. Dylan getting the scoop on Van Leeuwen ice cream. It's also important to stay like reinvigorated. Uh, we always work scoop shop, mm, like shifts. You actually work there. We, we still do, all of us. And we're getting a taste test today, Thursday, August 3rd, 2023. Live from Studio 1A in Rockefeller Plaza, this is the third hour of today. Good morning, everyone. It's the third hour of today on this Thursday. Friday Eve. Friday Eve. Eve. I'm Dylan here with Al. Obviously, Craig and Chanel are off today, but we've got our good friend Jacob Sober. Howdy. Howdy, everybody. Howdy. 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 You've been throwing like weird one-liners all morning. I don't know what is this morning. Oogly doogly. Oogly I said in the makeup room this morning. Wow, all of a sudden you're Ned Flanders. Yeah, thank you. I knew you I knew I knew Al would get that one. Well, we do have a great show lined up for you this morning. We're going to start with some excitement because if you can believe it, football is back. Football is back. The NFL preseason starts tonight with the Hall of Fame game between the Cleveland Browns and the New York Jets. It's going to happen right here on NBC. That's right. We've got NBC's Kaylee Hartung in Canton, Ohio for all the fun in the NFL. Kaylee, good morning. Hey, good morning, guys. We are having all the fun. You know, they like to say it's always football season here in Canton, Ohio. This is the birthplace of the NFL, after all. And tonight, the excitement, it really takes off as the Jets and the Browns kick it all off. J-E-T-S. The wait is finally over. Browns, Browns, Browns. Six months after Patrick Mahomes and the Kansas City Chiefs dominated the desert in Super Bowl 57, hey, get this man right here. football is back. The world is starved for football, so once it's on and we're under the lights, I know everybody's tuning in. Tonight, the annual NFL Hall of Fame game. NBC broadcasting the first preseason contest, matching up the Cleveland Browns and the New York Jets. You were a lifelong Jets fan. Absolutely. Have you ever been this excited for a season? I have not. We have not had a good quarterback since Joe Willie Namath. The Jets haven't been to the playoffs in over a decade, but the biggest trade of the offseason has gangrene flying high. We're talking about one of the biggest names in football. Yeah, for sure. After weeks of speculation, Aaron Rodgers, the longtime quarterback of the Green Bay Packers, is officially heading to the New York Jets. Tonight, a chance for long-suffering Jets fans to see the four-time league MVP on their sideline for the very first time. He's one of the best to ever play the game. He's got a lot left in the tank. He's got a lot left to prove. It looks like he's really enjoying him being in New York, and I can tell you New York is enjoying having him here. Like most stars, Rodgers won't see much playing time in the preseason, but he definitely knows how to play the media game. I wouldn't mind playing in the preseason. Uh, I wouldn't mind. You know, I think it's going to be a New York Jets takeover. The game in Canton, just an hour's drive from the Browns' home field. Cleveland's head coach Kevin Stefanski, confident Browns fans, known as the Dog Pound, will be out in force. The Hall of Fame's in our backyard, practically, uh, and I think all of Cleveland's coming with us. We've always watched the games, but having the Browns here is just amazing. Excitement for a fresh start, made even sweeter this weekend, as both teams celebrate former players joining the most exclusive club in sports. Joe Thomas, Joe Klecko, and Darrell Rivas, among the nine inductees into the NFL Hall of Fame Saturday. This is what happens at the Hall of Fame. Who signed your shirt? The mock is where? In person. Huh? How cool is that? This group of friends connected through their military service, driving six hours from New Jersey to football's most hallowed ground. So you don't just have to be a Jets fan or a Browns fan to be here right now. Yeah, you have to be a Yeah, you do all the things. He's saying, you got the Rams. Rams, we got them all. Yep. Just got to be a football fan to be just here. Just got to be a football just, fan. Those guys are going to have a blast tonight. We know the fans are amped up. And as for the teams, well, the Browns, since they're so close by, they're actually just hopping on buses to make the short trip today. Head coach Kevin Stefanski said to me with a smile, it's like a throwback to high school football days and the way they all used to travel then. The Jets, though, they flew in last night and traveled in high style. Sauce Gardner, he tweeted this video from the team's double-decker plane. He said he's never been on one like it. He called it the Aaron Rodgers 
Rogers effect. But if you guys want to see the effect this team really wants Rogers to have, check this out. The team visited the Pro Football Hall of Fame when they got into Canton last night. And there's a Rogers Packers jersey on display from his 2020 season. One of those four years he won the MVP title. But that's what the Jets want to see. More Rogers play that is worthy of being honored in the Hall of Fame. Guys. Mm. That's right. Well, thanks, Kaylee. This is going to be kind of interesting this year. Are you excited about this, Bobby Flay? Oh, look who's here. Yes. Yes, Aaron Rodgers in the house. Oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. Can I, I say know. something? <laughs> Nobody's ever invited me on a double-decker plane before, and no. uh, I don't think it'll happen anytime that's right. soon. <laughs> and, hey, don't forget, you can catch tonight's Hall of Fame game here on NBC and Peacock. Coverage beginning at 7 p.m. Eastern with the return of Sunday Night Football Night in America! <laughs> Even though it's on Thursday. That's so. not right. It's on Thursday night. On Thursday night. <laughs> Same difference. All right, well, nothing quite says game day like firing up the grill. And who better to give us a few tips than the grill master himself, Mr. Bobby Flay. You've got a brand new season premiering uh, this month. of uh, your show, Bobby's Triple Threat on the Food Network. So, good morning. Good morning. Good What's morning. up, Bobby? I, I heard Al, for the first time, describe pistachios as the muscles of the nut world outside. Yes. Concur <laughs> or disagree? Yes, but, um, you know, he's, he's talking about, obviously, shelling them. Right. And I just I like to buy them already shelled. Oh, so you can just fair, fair you can just and, stick your, you your eat, exactly. You eat too many. I know. They so used to be a, red. What was the point of that? I don't know. Like, they used to oh, that's them. right. They used to yeah. dye them dye red. Them in red. fact, it was it was I a gag. And, and it was a gag in in. Uh, in uh, uh, Police squad. So I love this episode shows. of Seinfeld or yeah. the third yeah. hour of today's show. Anyway, uh, so we got I, these questions. I had a question for Mr. Flay. So do people uh, that are out on the plaza. Our first one comes from the Copeland family. They're visiting from Texas. Take a look at this, Bobby. Okay. Hey, Bobby. What's the key to a perfect burger? Mm. The key oh. for the perfect burger? Yes. yes. Uh, well, first you have to pick out the proper amount, uh, the, the, the proper kind of meat. I, I like to say 80-20, which mm -hmm. means 80% beef, 20% fat. Right. You want to make sure you have enough fat in there so that it has a lot of flavor and also keeps the, the burger nice and juicy. Mm -hmm. And then whatever you're cooking your burger on, uh -huh. make sure it's very hot. Whether it's a grill, a pan, a flat top, mm -hmm. you want to get a really great crust. Right. Season it with salt and pepper so that you start... You start with the patty first. Right. Mm. Everybody always worries about the condiments. Those yep. will always come in and make things taste good. Sure. But start with the burger first. Where do you fall on the smash burger? Um, I'm not... A I don't hate a smash burger, but I actually like my at Bobby's Burgers. Our burgers are, are cooked medium, and they, I mean, there's nice there's something to, there's something to bite into. Right. Yeah. Uh, I, I get why smash burgers are popular because it's like they're just a bunch of crusty meat, you know. It sounds like a character. But I want to taste the beef. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I like like bite in. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. We have another question um, from Texas. This is Matt from Houston. Hey, Bobby. How do we avoid burning our burgers on the grill? Don't yeah. burn them. There you go. I mean, talking about high heat. No, exactly. Well, Matt, I mean, don't burn them. <laughs> Doctor, it hurts when I do that. Don't do that. <laughs> well, uh, it's actually a very good question, and it, and it makes perfect sense. And sure. the bottom line is that I think most of the time people get afraid of burning things, and they flip things too quickly. Ah. Mm. If you keep, if you fl let's go back to the burger for a right. second. If you flip and turn and flip and turn, you're never going to give the grill or whatever you're cooking it on a chance to actually form a crust. Right. So how many flips do you do? Just two for one. one flip? One. One, one flip. flip only. You want one, yeah, Al knows this. Don't you, move you, your meat. One flip. Let the grill do its job. You get it nice and crusty. You flip it over. You turn it, and then and then you finish it. All, All right. right. Okay. Uh, next one is about grilling uh, veggies from Len. Lenny. Hi, Bobby. I'm from Minnesota, and I would like to know your favorite way to cook sweet corn. Sweet corn. Sweet corn. Ah. Ooh. That's a good question. Uh, again, this is about overcooking, undercooking. Right. Um, now. Some people like to take the um, take the corn in the husk. Right. They take the, they take those uh, those sort of strings out first, mm -hmm. and then cover it back with the husk. Dip it in water and then cook it on the grill. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then what you do is you get a nice smokiness on the outside right. of the corn, and it kind of trans transfers to the corn itself. If you want to make it easier on yourself, what I like to do, especially grilled corn, is take the husk, take the strings out. Dip it in some water for like uh, some hot water Dip for what the whole the cob like the corn the cob okay. in in the in in the water for like uh, 
90 seconds. Right. Okay. okay, just get it going. Get your grill hot, and you can do this. You can do that part ahead of time. Sure. And then a little olive oil, salt, and pepper. Grill Boom. it, and then you get the corn is cooked perfectly. Right. And then you get the you get a little smokiness from the grill. And the char. So you oh. boil it for 90 yes. seconds. Yes. Yeah. And then a ton of butter on that. Oh, yeah. that's there, there you go. Without any food. I, I, I make basil butter, just fresh basil oh. butter, and then oh. slather, slather it on. Slather it on. A little yeah. veggie yeah. butter. Uh, uh, we saw this video, and I thought of you, Bobby, because take a look at this. There's this truck carrying nacho cheese on. <laughs> An Arkansas highway what? spilled all over cans of, of nacho cheese <laughs> everywhere. The only thing that would have been more perfect is if there had been a tortilla chart <laughs> yes. that crashed into it. But I thought of it because your cat's name is Nacho. That's right. Nacho <laughs> Flay is, is definitely my cat. Uh, actually, Nacho oh, has his own food cat. company. Oh, wow. Made by Nacho. You can. Is that a Maine Coon? That's a Maine Coon. He's that's 21 like a, pounds. 21 pounds? Yeah. yeah don't mess with Nacho. Yeah, my daughter's got a Maine Coon. And I, it's, yeah. it's like a bobcat. I have two of them. I love them so much. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, but we definitely need some tortillas What's the other for, one's for that name? mess. Uh, Stella. Oh. Yeah. Stella! Stella, yeah. I like it. I love it. Yeah. Oh, Thank you're the man, Bobby. Great. Thanks for hanging around. We love Cat dads everywhere. Let's go. Yeah. <laughs> Cat so dads. Season two of his show, Bobby's Triple Threat, it premieres August 22nd on the Food Network. And coming up next, you guys, we are helping you beat the heat while you sleep, including when to shower to stay the coolest. And then Dylan's got such a good story. She takes us behind the brand, behind the scenes of Van Leeuwen ice cream. So delicious. Ooh. We'll be right back in the third hour today. Can't That's good wait. ice cream. So yeah. good, isn't it? Very good. That is good. Good. Took my kids of the day. This morning on today's checklist, we are helping you catch your Z's while staying cool this summer. Dr. Carol Ash, sleep specialist with RWJ Barnabas Health, is here to walk us through it all. Good morning to you. Hey, Good, to see you. Good morning. <laughs> okay, let's start with uh, the first one. Before we even get to how to sleep in the heat, let's talk about how summer in general affects sleep patterns. I was just talking to somebody the other day that said, I cannot sleep hmm. tossing and turning in all the heat. There's really more challenges in the summer to our sleep than we really consider. First, there's daylight savings time, mm -hmm. so we've turned the clock an hour ahead. And the importance of that is that means we're going to be exposed to more light at night and more dark in the morning. And you need the dark at night to help you to fall asleep. It releases melatonin, so that can disrupt your sleep. And you need seven to nine hours as an adult and it's up to 10 hours for preschool kids. So mm. it can be a problem not getting that sleep. If you miss 15 minutes a night, it could be as if you didn't sleep all night, month, really, a 24 hour wow. loss. Yeah, it's cumulative, so people don't realize that. And then the temperature can wreak havoc with your sleep. You need to transition into sleep in these lighter stages of sleep that are sensitive to the temperature, and they need to be stable. So what happens is you don't get that stable first and second stages of sleep and you fail to get into the deeper stages which mm. is where the magic happens all mm. that cell repair and the memory mm. being consolidated and all the things we think of clearing the toxins. Oh, sounds so nice. Yeah. So, so then nice. how do you cool down to yeah. sleep? Well you first you have to realize we sleep in a much cooler environment so if you haven't you know the ability to put the, the thermostat down you want to keep it at 65 mm. degrees. Really? Okay. Yes but obviously not That's my problem. possible I was for everybody. I last night. <laughs> yeah. I was hot and uncomfortable and I couldn't couldn't sleep. 65. And, wow. and you know, the body sleeps. It's just a two degree difference that you have to drop the temperature of the body. So if, if you can't cool the room to 65 degrees, there are some tricks. And you mentioned it the shower an hour before you go to bed at night. Now, here it's not necessarily so intuitive. You think a cold shower, mm -hmm. it's actually the reverse. 
a hot shower. Oh, yes. Really? And the reason for that we think is is a hot shower will cause the, the blood vessels out in the periphery to dilate and allows the heat to dissipate, right? Oh. And then that will help drop the temperature about two degrees. That's all you need. And you want to curtains, close the curtains during the day. Mm -hmm. You'd be surprised. It can really just drop the temperature just enough to allow that sleep to be stable the first part of the night. Or a fan, get a fan, keep the room cool. So those things can really make a big difference. Hmm. Is it true, by the way, that if you have a fan pointing directly at you while you're sleeping, that's not a good thing? Well, it, it depends. I mean, obviously, some people might have problems with allergens, but for the most part, that cooling and moving of the air, again, if it helps you fall asleep at night, everybody might need to try something mm. that works best for them. You like always kick a leg out. Correct. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, in the summertime, too, right, we have travel. People are going places, and you don't realize when you travel to a new location, you have the first night effect. So take right. something familiar from your mm. room to cue the brain to go to sleep, mm -hmm. read a book, get rid of electronics, those things can all make a difference. Hey doc, asking for a couple of friends here, uh, as, <laughs> as they get, as their kids are getting ready to go to school, back yes, to school, yeah. how are you, how do you transition your kids? Al, I'm so glad you mentioned it because you know what, it, you actually have to start a couple of weeks before mm -hmm. because you know, when we go to summer, all the schedules and routines. My kids have yeah. been staying up so late. Yeah, they're right. like, oh, I could stay up till nine. I yes, and, and, and it's really not good. So 15 minutes a night, just adjust the clock so mm -hmm. you bring the bedtime time earlier because right summer light at night everybody's going to bed later getting up later which is fine yeah. you have to adjust the clock so that you transition into school great mr roker thank you for asking yeah. that well, on behalf I mean, of your friends now i know and dr ash thank you to you too great to see you yeah when mine were smaller it was like <laughs> impossible to get them to school yeah. right. they love staying up late in the summer yeah all right well coming up one of our next guests won't be needing any help in the sleep department because he calls himself the american nightmare <laughs> wwe's cody rhodes is here he's going to tell us all about his big SummerSlam matchup. But first, I've got the story of Van Leeuwen ice cream turning one truck into a booming business. We'll be right back. And we are back with our series behind the brand and Dylan you've got a great story I'm jealous of this one. this oh, was a good one and you know how much I love ice cream I actually had the chance to meet the team behind Van Leeuwen ice cream and got the scoop on how they grew their business from a tiny truck to an ice cream empire take a look we want to make products that people taste and want to keep eating. Ben Van Leeuwen, Pete Van Leeuwen, and Laura O'Neill are the minds behind the artisanal ice cream company, Van Leeuwen. Just touch on the dynamics of, of this trio here. Pete, you're the older brother. Ben, you're the younger brother. Laura, you're Ben's ex-wife. Yes, so, and he's my ex-husband. And he's your ex-husband, <laughs> yes. So how does this work to keep this company running? There's no filter, there's no inhibition which sometimes makes things hard, but what's even better and what cancels that out is like there's complete and utter trust. It all started with Ben's sweet gig, driving an ice cream truck as a teenager. After college, I said, huh, I wanna do something in food. The only thing I know about is running an ice cream truck. And at that time there weren't ice cream trucks serving super high quality ice cream. So I said, let's do this. I called these guys and that was kind of the start. The co-founders bought two 1980s decommissioned step vans off of eBay, renovated them inside and out, and got the wheels rolling. It all started in my apartment on Driggs Avenue right here in Greenpoint, so Brooklyn. Apartment. 
-hmm. Yeah, and Ben and Laura <laughs> moved in. We wrote a business plan. We developed some of our first formulations and then sort of ruminated on the dream for a little while. We invited 30 or maybe 40 friends over and they tasted probably 100 ice cream. Yeah. Like wow. 15 chocolates, 15 different vanillas, Sicilian pistachio, Turkish pistachio, strawberries from different places. Pete, how would you say it was received right off the bat? From day one when we drove up to the corner of Princeton Green and a line formed and it really didn't stop for that entire summer, we knew that we were onto something and doing something right. A year or so later, Van Leeuwen opened their first brick and mortar location right in the Brooklyn neighborhood where it all began. But the team doesn't want to sugarcoat the journey. It's right here, eight years into the business, at this factory, our entire company's inventory sat in one walk-in freezer and somebody left the door of that walk-in freezer open. I entered the factory to see a beautiful river of pink, white, brown oh, ice no. cream pouring in. Neapolitan and I walked into the freezer <laughs> and there were hundreds and hundreds, maybe thousands of tubs. Collapsing upon collapsed, themselves. Collapsed, crushed. Oh. And I don't know what we did. I guess we made more ice cream. I know what we did. We, we all yeah. came here and we salvaged what we could and we cleaned it all up and we Snow shoveled dusted and we ourselves going. off yeah, and we enough. kept on going. Today, Van Leeuwen is celebrating 15 years in business, has nearly 50 scoop shops across the country and can be found in the freezer aisle at stores like Walmart, Whole Foods and Sprouts. They're also known for their surprising brand collaborations and unique flavors like honeycomb, black cherry chip and lemon poppy seed muffin. What advice do you have for someone who's, you know, whether it's in the food industry or just in general to start a business? Make sure it's your passion because running a business is not, it's not a quick thing. You'll wake up one day and you've been doing it for 15 years and you want to still be excited about it. It's also important to stay like reinvigorated uh, we always work scoop shop, mm, like really shifts. You actually work we, we still do, all of us. Really? There is nothing in this business, to me, that's more rewarding and fulfilling than like handing off an ice cream cone to somebody. Well, I'd love to see how this all gets made. Yeah. Can I get a little tour? Absolutely. Let's take a look. Ben treated me to a factory tour and put me right to work, helping the crew mix the flavor of the day, Earl Grey tea. Oh my gosh, it is a giant tea bag. Yeah. Really good. For a cherry on top, we hopped on board the iconic ice cream truck with Pete and Laura for my very own scoop shift. What can I get for you? A recipe for a perfect day. Guys, thanks for letting me crash the party. Thank you so much for coming. 15 years. Congratulations. Thanks. Cheers. 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 <laughs> Mm -mm. Wow. It is mm. so, so creamy and delicious, delicious. and the no. flavors are like the best of the best The honeycomb flavors. is out of control. The, the flavor honeycomb. you made, the a, a Earl Grey, it's kind of like a green tea ice cream. It, and it ha it's it's literally steeped in Earl Grey tea, and it just brings that flavor all I was throughout. shocked. So I, I thought it was, you know, like, they can't really use real tea, but that's exactly it's, what they're it's doing. It's incredible. Yeah. Um, it's also cool because uh, Van Leeuwen is going to be the official ice cream Sunday mm. of the U.S. Open. They're oh. also releasing a flavor collaboration with Chef Jean Georges this fall. Wow. And they just hired a lead ice cream taster. Yes, that's a real job. No, I did not get it. Uh, but you can <laughs> learn more about that on today.com slash food. Wow. I taste notes of... A vanilla and, and, and chocolate. And, and Earl Grey tea. They have this like double, double dark chocolate mm. that I had with my kids the other day. Super, They super also have delicious. a whole um, vegan line, right. which I've tried, you know, because they gave me a whole bunch of samples. It, it, you don't even you don't notice it. It's still just as Absolutely. creamy and delicious. Oh, wow. Great, Excellent good great one. story. I love that story. Yeah, I love that. Well, coming up next, we're going to head to the ring with WWE superstar Cody Rhodes sharing a new look at his famous wrestling family. Then later, it's the shower gadget you wish you'd known about earlier. Not low flow. Don't like the sound of that. <laughs> Turning your morning routine into a spa day. Third hour today. I'll be right back. I'm with you on that.
guest is no stranger to wrestling fans. WWE superstar Cody Rhodes is here. He's the son of the legendary Dusty Rhodes. And like his dad, Cody made a name for himself in the ring, too, winning several championships. This weekend, he's going to face off against Brock Lesnar at SummerSlam. And his new documentary, American Nightmare, Becoming Cody Rhodes, premiered just this week on Peacock. So it takes a personal look at Cody's career, including the one thing he couldn't do for his dad. Check it out. I really want to win, guys. God, I want to win. I do. Is that Papa? But it's not just about that anymore. I still can't hand it to him. I still can't tell him nobody can take it away from you now. I have my own family. Baby. Ooh. Baby. Jeez. You know, one day, She's going to tell somebody that her dad was Cody Rhodes. Wow, this is a real personal. Mm. Can't believe you played that clip. Yeah, oh, he's tearing up there. He's tearing up here. Up here. Uh, uh, was it difficult to, to open up so personally? I mean, you know, you're one person in the ring, but this is a, a raw look at who you are. I think uh, as time went on with the documentary, I first you know heard about it and I was so excited and ego was filled up. Oh, they're going to make this documentary about me. They should. <laughs> and then it became a lot of, well, in the world of sports entertainment and pro wrestling, the suspension of disbelief, you've got to be the thing that's real. You have to, all, all of it, be as, as vulnerable as possible. And I just was a big fan of the team that put the documentary together. Ben Hauser from ESPN, Matt Brain at WWE, just did a really good job of capturing something that's very real mm -hmm. uh, in our world, and I was happy with it. Mm -hmm. Part of the story, of course, <clears throat> Cody, excuse me, is your dad, Dusty. Mm -hmm. What was the moment for you that you realized watching him, I want to do this too? Oh, there's, there's so many moments that kind of reinforced for me. I got to do this. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the coolest things, you know, I, I had that experience of, with Liberty where I got to put her in the ring and then I, I took her out. He did the same thing with me as my earliest memory when I was very young. Wow. But one of my favorite things is when he'd leave arenas, it was the Omni in Atlanta or the Forum in LA, whatever, MSG, when he'd leave these arenas, there's always fans who gather. And I didn't, you didn't know until you'd see that and everyone's mm -hmm. chanting his name and just this <laughs> whole presence. It's like he grew 10 feet tall. And I just thought, well, I'm never going to want to do anything else. This yeah. is it for me. Yeah, it's incredible. Um, let's talk about this weekend. Big summer slam. You've got Brock Lesnar. Mm. It's the rubber match. You've won one. He's won one. And mm. now it's like the ultimate who's who's going to win. So how are you feeling leading up to it? Well, you said it so politely. <laughs> like, um, oh, you got Brock Lesnar. Yeah, I know. Uh, <laughs> but if you've ever seen Brock Lesnar, he is a uh, Certainly, probably the toughest guy ever in the industry. Him and Harley Race, I'd say, are the toughest to ever step into a ring. Absolutely giant. Two NCAA championships, UFC heavyweight championship. I love the idea that I'm going into SummerSlam with him, but even now, like, I can't be a fan mm -hmm. of his. Mm -hmm. he, yeah. w with what we do, you got to yeah. win. Yeah. Mm -hmm. At the, the, the big ones, you got to win the big ones. And uh, this is certainly that is the rubber match. Uh, I'll tell you some funny. I was concerned the first time I stood across from Brock that he might be a little taller and I don't I don't want to I don't want to not be seen right. I want to don't I want to be dwarf sure yeah so I started cheating a little towards the camera and I realized oh. we might be the same height actually the problem is he's triple my width that's, <laughs> I that's, knew there was going to be some trash that's talk. the actual oh. issue he's just yeah. a he's just a giant giant uh, man uh, but I look forward to it Ford Field Detroit special place yeah wow. that's Lord. great we're excited for you, Cody, and can't wait. Will you come back again? Uh, absolutely. And bring Liberty. She's yes, a, please. Say hi to her for us. <laughs> Thank you. Back. So you can stream WWE SummerSlam live this Saturday, 8 p.m. Eastern on Peacock. And make sure you check out Cody's new documentary as well, American Nightmare, Becoming Cody Rhodes. Ooh, I love it, Cody. Peacock. Thanks again, man. Thank, Thank you guys you. so much. Thank um, you. We got a good shop all day coming up, guys. We got some fan favorites, including the perfect jeans and boots to get you ready for Dare We Say. Say it, no. fall, and later Wolfgang Van Halen is here to tell us all about his brand new album. We'll be right back. Don't go anywhere. Wolfie!
morning on Shop All Day, we've rounded up all the stuff we love that we know you will too. And here to tell us about some of these fan favorites is Shop Today editorial director, the one, the only, Adriana Brock. And remember, if you want to purchase any of these items, just scan the QR code at the bottom of your screen. What's up? Hey, Good guys. Morning. I'm so excited yep. because Stuff We Love is actually our Shop Today newsletter that people mm -hmm. can sign up for and get daily favorites every single day. Right. So we're sharing some of the stuff we love at Shop Today. Is this, this like a multi-use thing? This first one is a multi-use from Magic Molecule. It's called The Solution. Now, the mm. brand says it has over 100 uses. Whoa. We didn't put it to the test. However, people really like this for redness on your skin. So sunburn, rosacea, mm -hmm. eczema. Oh, it helps it sort of you spray it on wherever. Um, the brand says it's safe for kids and adults. Definitely ask your dermatologist before mm -hmm. you use it. But it's made with um, hydrochloric. Al's not asking. <laughs> Al's not going for it. Bumps. Yeah. Yes. Um, the brand says it's made with um, hydrochloris, which mm -hmm. is a natural thing we produce in our white cells to heal but skin. What, what is so it? It's, it's magic. How do it know? It's, it's a solution magic. made with that ingredient. So okay. it helps heal the redness. Got okay, it. cool. Yeah. Next. <laughs> okay, the next thing is a manicure. I'm trying to figure out what it is. I'm like, I think it's, this is. This is a manicure. Must Somebody have. didn't read the note. <laughs> no, I did, but. It's okay, I got you. This is from uh, Dermalect, and this is an awesome uh, like manicure hack that we love at the Shop Today office because it not only is a nail polish that's going to brighten and strengthen your nails, it's made with proteins. Hmm. So you get like that hardening effect, and it helps over time make your nails healthier, which, oh, I Dylan, need that. I know. You bite your nails. I know, so I this know. is kind of perfect you really? for you. Well, I oh, do, yeah. but I always uh, get a too. gel manicure so that they don't break, but I need something to actually make them healthy. Exactly. So this kind of helps. Lauren on our team tried it out, and it's a really subtle milky shade. Mm. So it's not like a red color or a bright mm. color that you can mess up. It's a little yeah. bit foolproof in that you could just sort of put two layers on. on, and it's easy, and it's not only making your nails brighter, but mm -hmm. also like helping that. treat. I understand treat you have a question for us. I have a question for you guys. Okay. You guys know I love asking about your showering habits. <laughs> yes. So, <laughs> a little too much. You guys you guys actually scrub your feet in the shower. I do. Yeah. You do? Yeah. I actually do. No, I don't. I, I don't scrub the kids' feet. I just sort of let the soap wash it off. But I, I okay. I just, give a little, I just give a little brush. Okay, well, <laughs> maybe you one. need a little more brushing because do? experts do say I, that you should I've got be a, scrubbing I've got a loofer your feet. Bottom or top? I've got a loofer. Bottom, top. All of it. In between the toes? In between everything. Wow. And this has got you covered. It really? is a foot scrubber pad okay. that has little that suction cups. Yeah, it, it might tickle, but it's made with silicone, so it's antimicrobial, and you can hang it up to dry. Nice. You can really it's get in really there. nice. You can uh -huh. really get in there. It's going to get all those hard to reach it's areas. Got suction cups on the and, bottom. And make sure your feet are clean. So, so in the shower, put it on the ground. Put it, go, put it on the ground in the shower. Oh, okay. You know what? Somebody ought to come up with toe floss. You know, just oh, to be able to get in floss. Floss. I don't know about that. I think I <laughs> Al Roker's toe floss. Wolfie likes the idea. <laughs> Wait, do you need toe floss? Well, you know, you, 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 uh, got, you know, you got toe jam. You know. Well, look. Look at these jeans. Fact, I don't have toe jam. You're the one with the toe jam. Uh, it's toe jam. I don't All have right. toe jam. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's move, on. let's move on to fashion. So we're, it's still summer, but we're thinking ahead for fall, right? Like and there's nothing like a classic pair of jeans. Mm -hmm. These are from Madewell. I really love them. I'm actually wearing them. This oh. is the first time you've worn pants on TV. <laughs> it is the first time I've worn <laughs> pants on TV okay. to show you guys. So you're, you're your own prop. I'm my own prop today. Yes. Um, but these are really great because you get the trendiness of the kickout flare, which mm -hmm. is really hot right now. But you get the fitted look that yeah. I feel is really nice on a lot of people who may not be into the They're baggy very flattering. mom jean trend. Mm -hmm. They're really you know flattering. You know who These mannequins. These, yes. They might. They might. And then for the oh, guys, feet. <laughs> Jacob, and for the guys, I brought you guys some 1991. These are really nice. Vintage Madewell oh, wow. um, 1991 jeans is what I didn't know called. Madewell did men's jeans. They do men's clothes. Oh. They do men's jeans. And these are really How great really because know? you get that like wider look and mm -hmm. the rugged look of like the 90s vintage jean. I love it. But you get these the modern so classic. retro. Look. They're yeah. really cool. Yeah. And they're like really it. in style right now. And guess what? Because we love these jeans so much, mm -hmm. we got a discount for our viewers. We have 30% oh, off. nice. The oh. Men's and women. I'll be wearing great. these out today. Yeah. There you go. Right. I don't want to think about fall, but okay. we have to. We've got to think about fall. So boots. Have you heard of the coastal cowgirl trend? No. Okay. No. It's the trend that's going viral all over social media. Blame it on Beyonce or Taylor Swift, mm -hmm. but it's super popular and it's kind of like mixing See, cowgirl think, elements you doing it? into I think it would everyday work with clothing. This dress. I sure. Think, yeah, oh, yeah. You could totally look look rock it. You you just loofah first, please. <laughs> that's right. Well, we'll, well uh, Dylan is going to change during the break. Yes. Uh, Adriana, thank you yes, so much. Yeah. This is, uh, you guys, don't forget, by the way, you can purchase all the items by scanning the QR code at the bottom of the screen 
or do what Dylan didn't just come in and take them off the table. Today.com slash shop. We should mention today earns a commission from purchases through the QR code or links on today.com. You realize they're going to stick to the floor. Well, there's anyway, this, coming up next, in there. we're it's getting whole... ready to rock with Wolfgang Van Halen. No toe jam included. <laughs> Don't miss a live performance from Mammoth and VH. <laughs> Third hour of today comes right These back. Are really cute stuff. <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah, they're cute. That's right. Series on today is proudly presented to you by City. Ladies and gentlemen, when it comes to musical talent, our next guest is keeping it right in the family. Wolfgang Van Halen, the son of Eddie Van Halen, and our dear friend Valerie Bertinelli rocked the music charts literally with the release of his debut album from his band Mammoth, WVH. Well, now Wolf is gearing up to release his sophomore album entitled Mammoth 2, but before they head out on this headline tour, we've got him here with us. Wolf, Van, good to see you. Thanks Morning, so guys. much Thank for being here. Thank you so much here. for having us. Hey, before you get started, we want to go uh, into the archives. We found this uh, photo of uh -oh. your dad playing uh -oh. Uh, oh, with so you, cute. and you're in the crib. Yeah. Um, oh, when you goodness. see that photo and you get ready to say, like, tomorrow, MetLife Stadium opening up uh, for Metallica, what do you think about? I think I've had enough time to practice. <laughs> <laughs> you better be good at, at least I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> so what, what are you looking forward to as far as this, this new album? What, how is it different than the last one? Uh, it's a bit darker, a bit heavier. I think uh, it's fun. To, we, we all like, like our heavy music over here at Mammoth, so being able to play that stuff live right. is going to be well, fun. We want to hear it. We want to hear it right now. We're going to let you guys take it away. Here is Mammoth with W Mammoth WVH with I'm All Right. <laughs>
Uh, we have a we have a music critic. Uh, you made me come in. Sorry, Wolfie. I am so not <laughs> camera here. ready. This is embarrassing. Oh, stop it. We love that was you. Awesome. How proud Good are you? Job, this, honey. How proud are you? This group. Huh? I'm so, I love all these boys. You know, my name is Mama Wolf on the road. Oh, there you go. Thank Mama you Wolf. for that. Okay, new album, Mammoth Two from Mammoth WVH, out tomorrow. Third hour today. We'll be right back. Thursday? Sure so was. Yeah. All right. Coming up tomorrow, we've got puppies. A lot of puppies. Guys, <laughs> stick around. We're going to have a great fourth hour. Have a lovely day. Woo! Snoop Dogg is here, and he's got a new way to help us chill out this summer. Plus, celebrity designer and Project Runway mentor Christian Siriano gives us an exclusive tour inside his gorgeous Connecticut home. And Kiki Palmer's making headlines. The actress and singer dropped some big news her fans have been waiting for, and we're talking about it. It's, okay. it's today with Hoda and Jenna. The third day of August. Good to see you. Happy you're here. The weekend is right there. How right Hager there. is four years and one day old. Do we have to talk about it every day no, this well, week. I'm happy for you. Yeah, for we you. had a Paw Patrol. You know how you feel the day after a four year old birthday? <laughs> how many kids? Uh, there were 10, including Puppy and Mila. But you know how you feel, which is just kind of like, it might as well have been your 21st birthday party. It's exhausting. It's exhausting. Because, first of all, they're only, how long was it? Two hours? Two, oh, 4 to 5.30. Hour and a half, but at four, at 5.15, I go, how much is left? And one <laughs> of the moms work. goes, don't worry, only 15 minutes. <laughs> By the way, one of my favorite ways to go have a birthday, and I don't know if all, what cities have what, but there's something called Kidville oh, yeah. in New York where you show up, everybody comes, the place has it organized where yeah. you go in that room, you do sports, you do this, you do that. So that you don't have to be the, the cake fluffer. is there. When yeah. it's done, they put the presents in a hefty bag and hand you totally. the bag and tell you to hit the road. And it's out in two hours. Well, we did it at ours house. At your house, yeah. And it was like, um, we didn't open our pool this summer because... Yeah. Of life. We just didn't. And so it was like water balloons. And I yeah. was the cheerleader. So you're. I was the one that's like, hey, everyone, you, get a partner, you, you know? And Henry's like, they're four, dude. <laughs> I'm like, let's play hey, water balloons. You know why? Because you're I'm a teacher, teacher through and through. You can't help but even. And then not. we tried to do a sprinkler thing <laughs> that we bought at Target, but it wouldn't the work. Kind of yeah, so Henry was in charge of the sprinkler. She's like, we're just going with the old school sprinkler. Turn it on. I'm sure most of the kids were like, wow, that was really fun. But, still, but anyway, you know what? He'll, for you, for how yourself. about you? How, what's been going on with uh, you? Everything's good. Yeah, I was, um, you know what? I had a thing today where I was running late. It was the day that um, I hit snooze 
and I shouldn't have. And my alarm goes off at three, and I said, and instead of hitting snooze, I hit off. You did that today. Off. I just hit it off. And by chance, I looked, I opened my eyes, and it was like four. Ten, yeah, five to four. And four is when I'm in the car because it's an hour drive. So at least an hour drive. So, but what was weird was I saw it and I was like, hmm, I am late. I got up. I swear to you, I did it in slow slow motion. I walked to the shower, psh, got my shower cap, <laughs> pop, did the I, instead of like. Yeah, I didn't. I was like, I brushed my teeth in the shower, brushed my teeth, I put it down, put my lotions on. I was like watching myself from another point Angle. of view. Yeah. I went downstairs, I made my drink, AG1, I wrote <laughs> notes to my kids. I was very, and I was like this, you're late. I was saying, but I was- It's okay. But it's okay. The part that was a bridge too far was when I was trying to find my earbuds and I couldn't, and I looked in my bag and it was a mess. So what did I do? I unpacked it. I have four scrunchies, three lip gloss. I started cleaning things out. Have you ever done Why? a pro Yeah, I don't know. No, but isn't it so weird it's that like when you're late, you start to want to clean? Yeah, you're like, stop. Organize. Organize. I was like this, and I literally threw that. I actually took some cosmetics back up to my bathroom, put them in a drawer. <laughs> like, that's what I was doing. I was in that weird, and, but when I got in the car, because we get picked up in the morning, Eddie, who drives me, I was totally calm. I go, hey, Eddie, he goes, hi. You know, you're, you're all late. good? Yeah. I go, yeah. But I didn't make being late a the thing. story of my day. You know what's so interesting mm. is that whenever Henry knows that something's out of whack with me, the way he knows is I'm spraying down the counters <laughs> like a mint, just spraying. <laughs> like, he's like, dude, you used a spray because rubbing. something Because you're ordinary. Because I can control, control it. it. You could control cleaning that out the bag. weird. I, I can't even imagine. You don't know what was in there. Did you hurt Hope's yourself? spoon from I don't know when there's all kinds of stuff mold but, but it is true how you try to get some kind of samples but it did remind me like how you start your day yeah. you don't have to tell the story guess what I was totally. late guess what because that that becomes well you become frantic all day long yes when, if you choose to just be like because but guess what oh well worst case what you're gonna be a little, a little late, late and and You'll, I still was gonna make the show yeah. wasn't, I wasn't that you just have a yeah. like your hair won't look well, I mean well, although fine. your hair looks amazing so because so, Laura can do anything. Laura can do anything um, all right let's talk about multitasking are you a multitasker you know I am I love to multitask By the way, you will organize for somebody else like I'll sit here and I'll go gosh I'm really looking for a restaurant where okay hold on a second Okay, Julie's gonna help you. It's right here. You're gonna have a rest of our time. Make it at four. And literally in five seconds, the task has been completed. I like having a lot of things, a lot of balls in the air. You like that. You know, I like a lot. So what if you only had one thing to do on a given day? How would you, what would you, you don't, but if you, if that was really what you were tasked with, you were I'd not probably allowed. just get it done right away. Early. And then have a chill day. day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I don't know. I like to multitask, although there is a new article that in the New York Times that says, that you can't multitask. Stop multitasking. No, really, just stop it. Gosh, why are you <laughs> yelling at us New York Times? <laughs> they sound so strict. And the writer, yeah, is it Oliver Berkman? Yeah. yeah. So it's he, he's a man. <laughs> describes how it made him feel overwhelmed. So now he just focuses on doing one activity at a time. I think that's probably the right way. But sometimes one activity can't all be completed. You do part of it, and it's and there's not an end yet. So then you start this thing. Yeah. But, I'm not to not to stereotype, but of course a man says that because uh -huh. I kind of feel like they don't know how women, to do that. Well, they're not yeah. great at it, but also. There's no, I don't have a choice. Right. I have a child that's like, Mom, where's my toothbrush? Yeah. This, where's that? Yes. Where's that? Yes. While I'm trying to do one yes. thing. Yes. So you have to, can't, you can't say, when I'm completely finished totally. with this Totally. I'll task. pay attention to your Not needs. Not yet. I was on a, like a, an, a Zoom that I was so looking forward to yeah. yesterday, and Poppy was home just with me, but I mean, I was yeah. home with her. She comes in in the middle of the Zoom, I'm like... Yeah. <laughs> like back to 2020 vibes. I mean, the person could see me going. <laughs> and what, was it, and then was, she came in and yeah. they're like, oh, just, you know, I so cute. It, yeah. And she had cut herself with her oh. toenail. There was blood. She's like, it's all over my bed. I'm like, one minute. You know, you can't be like, <laughs> you can't be like hold on, Poppy. I'm in the middle of a Zoom. I need to complete the whole Let task. Let me finish this task. I know. By the way, yeah, with kids, it's a whole different yeah, ball game. I hate to say it. All right. um, okay, Kiki Palmer, big announcement. What is it? Okay, first of all, she's an actress. Yeah. She's a businesswoman. Yeah. She's a musician. She's now a mother. She says she's bringing her new album out on tour. I can't believe. Big Let's hear. I'm up 
absolutely going to tour. I'm literally putting a show together, I kid you not, and I will not disappoint y'all again. It's gonna have a little bit of everything. City is just the beginning. I mean, I didn't even know Kiki. Kiki Palmer was also had a talk show. She right. does every she single does thing. Every, and she does it all well. I don't understand it. She does it all well. It's so funny. I was just looking at some little piece of video, and it was Kira Knightley. And Kira Knightley was at a news conference, and a, a reporter yelled up to her, How do you balance work and family? And she just looked at the reporter, and she said to the reporter, I have a question. Are you planning to ask that very question to all the men here totally. too? And the girl, the woman goes, "Okay." She goes, "Okay, good, good." Yeah. Because again, it's like everyone's like, "She had a baby. She's got this." You yeah. know. But They're, if if she was a man, nobody, nobody would say, "How they'd do you like, balance?" Wow. You know how I feel about balancing. That's your favorite Sometimes word. Sometimes I get. I would. I like Kira Knightley for doing that. I thought it was cool. All right, Kiki. By the way, is going to be in Brooklyn, September 24th. Let's go. Let's go. <gasps> but also, look oh, who is in the house go. right now. Come on! Oh yeah, my he's God! Got some very cool summer plans, and we'll hear all about it right after this. Oh my God! Outfit on point. Yeah. He's a TV personality. He's an entrepreneur. The one, the only, D-O-double-G. Yeah, we are talking, of course, about Snoop Dogg. And he's taking a break from his sold-out high school reunion tour to come and hang with us. Hi, Snoop. We, How okay, are you? We love you. First of all, you. we've been bursting because... We're, yeah. We adore you. Yes. And high school reunion tour, we've heard it's been incredible. Yeah. It's, been, it's been amazing. Yeah, tell us about it. You got it. Burner, Drama, Warren G, Too Short, Wiz Khalifa, and myself. It's just a culmination of friends who've had a great run in this music industry, putting together a show where we can showcase our talents and our fan base. You got grandparents, you got uh, little junior high school students, you got mothers, you got families. It's such a great showing of people that come in to see us perform. It's, it's amazing to see the variety and the diversity of the, the the people that's coming to see oh, the show. Speaking of grandparents, yeah, we're talking to one. <laughs> yes, Paul. Paul. Hey, how does you got seven grandbabies? Yes. Oh, what do they call you? They call me Papa Noop. Papa, Papa Noop. Noop. <laughs> oh my God. What has been a, being a granddad? How has it been different than anything else you've ever done? Uh, I guess you could say that the the things that you did incorrect with your kids, yeah. you get to correct <laughs> with, your, with your grandbabies. Like, all the things I did wrong with my sons and my daughter, I don't do that at all with them. Are you Wait, a there's a video. You they get everything with me. They of get, course. The, 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 one of my granddaughters, I want her over. That's her Look right there, CC. Yeah, what's CC up to? She's calling you. She's looking for me. Oh, she's looking no. for you. And she says she'll play by yeah. herself. <laughs> 
Oh, because you're not there. She'll play yes. by herself. But I want her over with lollipops. <laughs> yeah, she used to didn't mess with me. She used to be like, get away from me. And I started giving her lollipops, and then I worked into her world of sweetness, and I became sweet. <laughs> oh, my God. Sweet. Don't you love that? Oh. Okay, high school reunion tour. Yeah. The name is so good. Did, mm -hmm. Have you ever gone to a high school reunion? Yes, I had mine in... The 30th anniversary. I graduated in 89, so when would my 30th be? 2000. I mean, don't we are, we're terrible at math. 19? Yeah, 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 20s, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. Okay, yeah. yeah, so I did the 30th anniversary and I had Color Me Bad perform. I had oh. Slick Rick and Dougie Fresh. I mean, you hosted what? It? I, I was a fan. I wasn't trying to, I was like <laughs> enjoying it with my classmates because these are the records that were big when I was in high school. So I just went and got hired the people that were the biggest artists at the time. And I hired them, and they came to perform, and it was beautiful. I oh love that. Gosh. So you've known your wife since high school? Yes. <gasps> high school sweetheart. It's yes. hard for uh, any relationship to go through all of life's changes and still wind up together. Usually they say you've got to grow together and just grow. How do you, why do you think yours has withstood the test of time? I think because we, we were both young, and we both were willing to sacrifice for each other. Yeah. Like, she knew what my dreams and goals was, and at the same time, I knew what hers were. Mm -hmm. And to have a family and to be who we are is what we both initially wanted to try to get to that mm -hmm. goal. And when we reached it, it was hard, definitely, because you know you got so many different things pulling you away from marriage mm -hmm. and people divorcing every other day. But yeah. when you truly love somebody, it ain't nothing you could do to break that up. And mm -hmm. I feel like that was true love at first sight. Doesn't that feel so lucky that you've gotten to spend all these years <laughs> with it, each other? It do, because I watch certain yeah. relationships break apart, yeah. and I'm like, ours is still together. What yeah. are we doing? Yeah, that what is are, incredible. Well, I love, you just evolve, and I feel like you grow in life, too, in relationships and in life. You grow in what you're doing, what you're producing, your friendships. I mean, we love your Martha Stewart friendship. Yeah. Every time she comes home, we talk, we talk about, to her you. about you. Her. She's like, is this our conversation? <laughs> yes, it Were is. Were you surprised by how close you guys have become? No, because I've always, my mother raised me to love people. Yeah. yeah. So no matter who they are, where they're from, what color they are, what they race, religion, or whatever, you love people. Yeah. And once yeah. me and Martha had a chance to just chop it up and be around each other, we found out that we had so much in common <laughs> that it made sense for us to start doing things together. <laughs> Y'all are What's both the, bosses. What you, yeah, what do you have in common? Um, we like to eat, we like to drink, we like to make money, we like to be business minded, and we're fun. Yeah. yeah. Oh my gosh. Okay, Snoop Dogg, there are some wild animal headlines. We oh, want to wow. get your take on them, okay? okay well, let's go. I'm a wild guy. First one People Magazine reported that a man in Japan spent $14,000 on a collie suit. He wanted to, to be, be a, a dog. dog. He wanted to be a dog. Okay. Come on, man. Yeah, that's that's a As the original dog, what do you think about spending that kind of cash to be a dog? Dog on it. <laughs> you need to stop with all that mess. Come see the D.O. Double if you want to be a D.O. Double G. That's right. All right, here's another one. An orangutan was caught driving a golf cart. Oh, that's my homeboy. In Dubai. <laughs> that's my dog. That's my guy right there. What up, though? What's happening with it? <laughs> see, giving it up on the... Is that hilarious? That's, that's my guy. Oh, my God. Oh my okay, God. wait. Finally, have you seen this bear? I love that, like, there's a lot of news in the world, but yeah. the Today Show's been all this over. This is a big one. Look at this bear. At a zoo in China. What I don't understand is the bear don't have a butt. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it makes me feel like this may be a human inside of a bear costume. But we, then when you see him get down on all fours, it looks just like a bear. Know, it's the weirdest he thing. He looks like he's having a total conversation. Yeah, totally. <laughs> he's holding court. Hey. Holding court. Okay, Snoop's going to stick around because he's got a scoop on his brand new ice cream. Yes. Scoop dog. I'm going to give it a try after this. <laughs> Coming up tomorrow, superstar chef Bobby Flay whips up a delicious...
singer-songwriter Elle King on motherhood, her new tour, and more. And summer savers from TikTok's King of Life Hat. That's all Friday on Hoda and Jenna. We are back with Snoop Dogg, who is not only an incredible enter entertainer, but also an entrepreneur. And his latest project is the sweetest one yet. He's got his very own ice cream brand. Snoop, what's it called, this brand? Dr. Bombay. Dr. Dr. Bombay. Bombay. All right, we've got flavors out here. Um, we're into this. So we're going to test drive one of these flavors, and you're going to tell us a little bit about it. This is rolling in the dough. Yeah, yeah, rolling in the dough. That's basically that vanilla mixed with that cookie dough, ooh, ooh, ooh. and okay. we rolled them well, together. Okay, rolling in the dough. Yeah. Um, what did you do with your very first paycheck when you were rolling in the dough? My <laughs> first paycheck, I bought me a, a Jeep Cherokee, put some gold Dayton's on it with some Vogue's, and put some 15-inch speakers in the back. Ooh, wow. Mm. Okay, this is delicious. Mm -hmm. okay, this next one is called Bonus Track Brownie. If your next album has a bonus track on it, who do you want to collaborate with? Oh, that's a good one. Oh, it would have to be Sade. Oh. I love me some Sade. Look at her. Look have at you. Me. Have you ever collaborated with Sade? Never. I went to her concert one time, and I was so groupy that I was scared to go get a picture with her. <laughs> really? I'm, I'm just like that. I'm still a big kid in there, side. Mm, star Everyone star. wants to collaborate with you, though. People it's are true. always lining up. Okay. This is Tropical Sherbert Swizzle. Bomb. Is this your favorite? Which one's your favorite? Bomb. These okay. two. Bang, okay. Bang. Okay. Okay. okay, so wait. If you had to spend the rest of your life, mm. Snoop, on a tropical island, mm -hmm. which one would you go to? You know, what is one thing you wouldn't live without? Bora Bora. <laughs> oh, you, I want to know where. Bora Bora? Bora Bora. Bora, Bora. Is Bora Bora Because I would never favorite? be Bora Bora. <laughs> mm. <laughs> oh, my God. That's that is so, so good. That's the one. Right. That is you. the one. Okay, Look at this you had to double up on it. Look at <laughs> <laughs> she came back for She's double. gonna just take this with her. The next one is syrupy waffle Sundays. Yes. What does a Sunday in your house look like? Sunday in my house, if it's football season, football, mm -hmm. leave me alone, get out the room, leave me alone, football. <laughs> mm. By the way, <laughs> who's your team? Pittsburgh Steelers. Mm -hmm. By the way, you know, it starts today. Oh, yeah. preseason. I can't believe it. The Hall game. of Fame game, right? Crazy. Yeah. Uh -huh. Come on now, you know I'm Are in you going to watch? Are you going to watch? I can't wait to get out of here, so I'm going to check it out. Okay, right. s'more vibes. S'more okay. vibes. Well, the vibes are just right. Mm -hmm. What's the most creative food combo that you ever concoct while enjoying yourself to satisfy your munchies? <laughs> Honestly, it was a dish that I put together that I learned over in Australia. It's called lobster thermidor. Wow. Yes. What, what is it? It's a unique dish where you have the lobster, you open it up, and then you put some sort of cream that you make, and you put, like, pieces of crust in there, and it's cream, and it's crust, and you're just eating the lobster out of the... What? ...with a fork, and everyone can eat it and enjoy it one time. God, that is... No wonder you and Martha are best pals. Okay, this is one I've been dying to. Cocoa cream cookie cream. Oh, you went double with the CCs. <laughs> double with the CCs. Okay, when you were a little boy, could you ever have dreamed that this is what your life would be? Never. I, I'd have this, no, my dreams were, I had like dreams that went around the corner and came back. Mm -hmm. They didn't have big dreams like this, so to, to, to live this out is a dream come true, but then again, it's not because I never dreamed of this. Mm. All right, iced out orange My favorite, cream. talk to what me. What is your iciest piece of jewelry that you own? The iciest piece of jewelry that I own, you guys own now. Oh my God, what? One for you, <gasps> and one for you. Wait, what? Yeah. What? Death Row Records. Death Row Records. Record. Record. Rose Gold. Oh, this is real. Oh yeah, this, this Rose is Gold. This is real. Wait, Wait, it's real? Yeah, Rose Gold, quit playing. That's what? Come on, take the plastic off. Okay, here. Oh, take it off this thing. On the back side, there you go. Okay. Okay, wait. We're cool. We're I'm finally cool. I'm gonna both of y'all up. Okay. But Did I you put it over the head like that? I, can, I got it, yeah. Can you do the same thing? I don't know. No, I'm gonna have to go behind it. My head is big. <laughs> It's, you can probably put it over your head. I don't think so. Oh, look, you're gonna get know. iced. You're gonna get iced anyway. Oh! Oh, you iced out. You in there now. Snoop, Snoop, we love we you. We love you. Can I get a double hug? Yes. We love you so oh. much. Oh, you're thank the best. You. Two thank scoops. You. That was a double scoop. There you go. <laughs> you guys get this ice cream. Uh -huh, it is yummy. crazy. Yeah. Coming up next, y'all designer Christian Seriano. Do you know him? Christian, I need some corals. What do you want? <laughs> right after this. That is legit. Right.
everybody. Good morning. Welcome to today. Every day. We are adding to the star power in our studio. The biggest names only on today. See, we're coming to this early, right? Everybody, but it's today. today. Like I won the lottery. How do you feel at this age, this stage? Liberated. We're just getting started, folks. Ain't no stop with us now. <laughs> the boys are back in town. Boys are back in town. It's a miracle. It's a miracle. This has been fantastic. Everything and everyone you're talking about. Only on today. Christian Siriano is one of fashion's biggest stars. He dresses everybody from Sarah Jessica Parker to Lady Gaga to Oprah. And to many, many more. He's also got a new clothing line, and he's the mentor of season 20 of Project Runway, where he's helping the next generation of designers follow in his footsteps. Christian, we're so happy you're back. Back. Thank you for having me. Okay, season 20, Project Runway. Mm -hmm. The Wild. newest episode airs tonight. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What can you tell us? It's Below Deck Challenge crossover. <laughs> Which is wild because mm -hmm. I don't even really watch Below Deck, but those people are <laughs> those people are amazing, and it is a really hard challenge because they're very opinionated and they're quite sassy. Um, but I think the designers bring it. Yeah, they do. I mean, you won season four. That was yeah. so far back in the day. Your it's life dangerous. exploded and changed. How did you? How did that ride go for you? Because it, it, you were kind of catapulted right into oh, yeah. the middle of everything. Oh, you're like thrown into this world, and you're like, have a business, have clothes yeah. for people to buy, dress. A celebrity that you've never met. Like, it is really wild. Well, what did it, you like? What was the big lesson you learned through I that? Think, I think for me, like, I just really wanted to, like, have a real brand. You know, I wanted that, yeah, sitting here 16 years later, that people would, like, say, oh, I don't know, it was more than just clothes. Actually, more yeah. than just clothes, yeah. You know? Um, so that's, like, very important to me that it meant that it means something a little bit. I mean, one of the things that you did and has been groundbreaking is that you have dressed women of all sizes. You were maybe mm -hmm. the first designer to do that. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Is that something you want to be known for? I mean, I just felt like I woke up one day and I was like, I don't think it's enough to just, like, make pretty dresses. We have to, like, have kind of a more of a meaning. And, and all mm -hmm. our job is is to make clothes. So I think, yeah, like, putting the first, you know, group of curvy women down a runway Mm -hmm. ever I mean why was that me like that's kind of weird mm -hmm. um, so I think that was very important to me and still is now now I'm trying to just make it that it's the norm and we don't have to talk about talk it as about much it. Right. Totally. Just, um, but it's still on the red carpets it still comes up it's wild well to get attention as a designer often you need a celeb yeah and you had to have a first celeb yeah. who said yes will you please dress me before anyone else got in line who yeah. was your first I mean it actually really was it was Victoria Beckham um, wow. technically because she was the finale judge on my season she invited me over to her house she bought actually almost half the collection Oh my god. Gave me a check and everything. Yeah, it was really, really elegant and chic. And I don't actually know if I've talked to her actually in a long time about that. But you know, that was such a big deal to me. Then I went over to Heidi's house, you know, then Sarah Heidi Jessica Clark. wanted something. You know, it just Sarah was a trickle. Jessica. But yeah. it is pretty amazing that you have had these mentors. Do you feel like it's important to mentor those? I mean, that's probably why Project yeah. Runway is this. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, that's why I wanted to do this. I think after the show, you're kind of thrown into this world. I was really thrown into it. So you need somebody that's kind of in the business. Yeah. Um, and that's why I wanted to mentor these designers. I want to help them. Let's yeah. talk about some of your Hall of Famers. Yes, you dressed please. everybody, but can we start with Janet Jackson? Janet, Janet Jackson. Janet, my girl. Oh, this my gosh. My girl. Okay. Well, here she is. There she, she is. is. Well. And you... For you, her tour. You, you made, made most of her looks? Yeah, we made a bunch of looks for her tour. Um, it was so incredible. We did her dancers. Um, it was a blast. And uh, I went to her show, and it was so crazy because afterward, we, we danced all night with her dancers <laughs> at a bar till 5 30 <gasps> what she had just done madison square garden two nights in a row 250 meet and greet and she's like i'll see you at one o'clock you ready i'm Wait, like what sure, 1 a.m yes did it you have to set best night of my you life stay up that late no i took <laughs> i it, espresso martinis the whole night for real <laughs> just to hang with just janet, to hang with janet. Um, okay the next billy porter <laughs> Yeah, this is like this needs to yeah. be in a museum. This it is, is it's, iconic. It's been in five. Um, oh, whoa! Yeah, yeah it has. <laughs> okay, that been, makes it's sense. been in the Victorian Auburn. I mean, it's been a lot. Um, no, but I think what's great about this is this really changed a lot of people's perception of like what men can wear. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and I think that's very important. You know, young generation to see what men can wear. Totally. Sarah Jessica Parker, you said, is one of your top yeah. iconic. Early, the ones early on. Yeah. Are you dressing her for the new? This is for. This is when she sees Aiden. What? Oh, you got for the first time. And just just like that. Just like that. Oh my gosh. I know. Are you team Aiden? We are. Yeah, I mean, I'm team. 
I'm Sarah saying, Jessica yeah, this Parker. is our Sarah. You know, Sarah in the pandemic, I will tell you, I had a big fashion show in the pandemic and Sarah gave me all her shoes and let me use them for the runway. And it was so amazing. And she's been uh, such a, a sweet, wonderful person. Okay. Um, okay, Julia Fox, last one. People are fascinated. Oh, oh yeah, just because she's a kooky crazy. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't <laughs> think this is one of my best looks in the world, but, <laughs> but Julia is so amazing to dress because she's so smart and actually so elegant and respectful. Yeah. It was really nice. I um, love it. Can we, we got to wrap up with Jennifer, Jennifer Coolidge. Coolidge. Yeah, we well, can't stop. Come the on. Queen. The queen. I've been dressing Jennifer before these oh, people really? jumped on. I, but this Look is, at that. This is like six years ago. That's so chic. Though. I went to the premiere with her. It was the best night of my life. Oh, my God. It's what? so, because she's genius and epic, and yeah. everything is funny. <laughs> Even just, like, opening the car door is funny. Like, <laughs> it's like, oh, my God, are we getting out? She's like, in a minute. Like, okay. <laughs> Love it. Um, okay, don't go anywhere, y'all. Yes, because we want to peek inside your fabulous Connecticut home. Oh, Will you yes. give us a tour? Yeah, a tour. All, All right. right after this. with designer and Project Runway mentor Christian Seriano, and it's time for another edition of... Hoda and Jenna's House Tour. Tour. It's Christian, do you like All our right. weird outfits? And I love it. Okay, <laughs> so when he's not busy at Fashion Week or styling celebrities for the red carpet, Christian is at his Connecticut home, and recently he gave us an exclusive look inside. Check it out. Hey, Hoda and Jenna. Welcome to my home in Westport, Connecticut. Come inside, see all the beautiful things. Okay, so like when you enter the house, this is obviously a very, very messy coat closet, but I looked in this today because I was trying to clean it, and there's like a gown in here. So I do think it's funny that like the gowns, even though I don't want to be at work, they just make it, they make it in here somehow. This is probably the favorite part of the house is the kitchen because it's massive, and it's just in one big room. You can hear the echo. But the thing is, I have a lot of cutting boards because this is soapstone and it's very easily stained stone. So I didn't want to put like just like ugly white plastic cutting boards down. So we have beautiful woods from all over the world and this warms up the space, okay? I know we have a lot of cutting boards. Don't come at me, okay, Hoda? Come on. For real, this is like what our refrigerator looks like. There's only drinks because we like order. You know, we're still New Yorkers, even though we're in Connecticut, and like we fake cook, which is like you like put the salad in a bowl that you order. It's great. We're really good at it. This is Poppy. Poppy's the queen of the house. She's Kate Moss. She's like not too tall, skinny, fabulous, kind of sassy. Kate Moss, perfect. And this is our living room space. And this space probably has like some of my favorite things here. Things from kind of like different artists that I love. Even like something like this. Like this was a piece that, this is from 1920s and my really good friend Selma Blair gave this to me for my birthday. So this has like a lot of memories. This piece my dad made actually and I still have it, which is hilarious because I don't know why he made this weird block sculpture, but I kind of love it. And just like art, Gigi Collins, Megan Morrison, we play chess. I'm actually really, really, really good at chess, for real. 
Okay, this is our hangout TV room. Don't judge it. It's kind of messy and crazy, but my favorite thing about this room is this Ashley Longshore painting. This is Lady Gaga looking over us. Ashley Longshore painted this as Lady Gaga in a dress that I did for her, and I just love it that it's in here. This is cool. This is like an abstract piece that I did a few years ago, and it brought some color into this house, which is, you know, pretty monochromatic. Come on, Poppy, let's show them upstairs. This is a really cool room. This is my tiny little art studio that I actually do paint a lot in. So I'm always kind of working on something. Most of them are fashion paintings of like ballerina dresses for some reason. And it's also doubled as a guest room, come on. I would love to sleep in here though because there's like, I bet you like the girls come to life like sugar plum fairies or something. Okay, then into my bedroom which is so pretty. This bedroom is probably the size of my entire apartment when I was just moving to New York. And the bathroom's the best part because you're in the tub and you float like in the air. So you're like in here and you're just like submerged in nature. It's the best part of the house. Go outside. Come on. And it's just beautiful. And again, we are not in California, people. See, Westport, Connecticut can be just as gorgeous. The weather, kind of. But it's pretty. This is like our little resort out here. That's what's great about Connecticut. It's to get away from the city, um, but still a really special place to just kind of, I don't know, build a family. It's been really nice. All right, ladies, thank you for coming to my home. Hope you loved it. Hope you felt inspired. Now we need a cocktail. Are you ready? By the pool. Let's go. Oh, oh my, my God, God, Christian, we want to move in. <laughs> I love your move house. In, we we want to move in. Love. That's amazing. But okay, before you go, you have to tell us about your new line. Yes, HSN. so excited. I'm the new creative director for Sea Wonder, and we are exclusive on HSN. And the clothes are just so amazing. I really wanted people, you know, of all walks of life, you know, someone like my mom that could buy, you know, can't afford always my clothes, could buy, you know, a $30, $40 dress. Um, mm -hmm. And that's what we're doing. So we're really proud of it. And um, and it's actually very fabulous. Amazing. So we can do a lot for $40. Okay, yeah, we are going to look that up. <laughs> By the way, yes. what a delight. You're yeah, so Christian, fun. You guys Thank, you. Thank you for Thank you. coming to see us. And y'all can catch Project Runway All Stars Thursday at 9 Eastern and Pacific on our sister network, Bravo. Coming up next, celebrating the life of a legend, Tony Bennett, my exclusive conversation with his wife and son after this. Welcome to today. So happy to see you guys. Would you like my boost? Yes. Back, here we go. Boom. Sometimes we just do things to help. That's our Hoda. <laughs> happy birthday. We got an awesome crowd, y'all. I left my heart. Oh, it's been less than two weeks since the world lost a legend. Tony Bennett and Hoda, he sat down for an exclusive interview with his family. Lovely, 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 wonderful people. I spoke with Susan Benedetto, that's Tony's devoted partner of nearly four decades, and his eldest son, Danny Bennett. And while Tony will be remembered as one of the greatest singers of all time, his family says his biggest legacy is kindness. It feels like He's just on the road and he's gonna come home any minute, you know? He didn't just light up a room, he just loved the room, you know? He just uh, was all love, all love, all the time. 
And all about love is how most anyone who crossed paths with legendary singer Tony Bennett would feel after being in his presence. But Susan Benedetto, Tony's partner of 38 years, and Tony's eldest son, Danny Bennett, got to live and breathe it every day. Why do you think your relationship spanned all those years? You know, he performed to everybody. He never saw generation gaps or anything. And so, and privately, we didn't either. You know, we just absolutely loved each other and uh, he was my life. Danny, to be Tony Bennett's son has to be, first of all, an amazing experience. How would you describe it? He was just the man of the, man of the people. And so we experienced that as, as kids. I never, thankfully, never took that for granted. Um, and, and, and it continued. <laughs> it was an amazing journey. And he was still making connections with new audiences, winning his 20th and final Grammy for an album with close friend Lady Gaga. When Lady Gaga obviously got his, his final Grammy with Lady Gaga, mm -hmm. what did you think of that relationship, Susan? Well, I mean, I think it was a tremendous gift to each of them. Yeah. But what she did for Tony, you know, they just hit it off. It Personally, musically, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I loved it. And the fact that she could help him to really ride out his career in, in such a great way. A career that never slowed down, even after being diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease in 2016. Did he know, like, explain what he knew about his illness? He really never did. When, you know, when he was diagnosed, uh, you know, Danny and I thought, you know, this is going to be it. He's going to have to slow down, you know. Yeah. And, but Tony's like, I don't know what you're talking about. You know, I want to keep singing. So even though you forget a lot with Alzheimer's, he remembered the songs. He could do that. It's amazing. He could do the songs. Uh, <laughs> the, last, this, uh, the week before he passed away. What Not was, even, just was, a couple days. Yeah, yeah. I think he was yeah. singing. He's singing. He's singing because of you. We were getting him up to exercise. I said, why don't you sing? He's like, what do you want to hear? I said, how about singing because of you? So he sang because of you. Because of you, there's a song in my heart. That was the last song he sang? That, literally, that was the last song he sang, yeah. And the week before, we were watching YouTube, and Tony was alert enough that he's like watching it. And he said, um, was I always popular? And I said, yes, sweetheart. I said, you were, I said, you've been popular for over 70 years. And he said, that's because I stayed with quality. Stayed stayed with quality. quality. Danny, there's this really great Martin Scorsese quote. He said, at a certain point, we started to imagine that Tony would live forever. Mm -hmm. Of course he didn't, nobody does. But the music, that's another story. Yeah. You feel like that's a pretty apt description of? I mean, it's interesting when you said, you know, what did you lose? And I. I I think it's more what I've gained. <laughs> In a way, that, that's what he gave me. Um, the best is yet to come. What was the last thing he said to you, Susan? Do you remember? That, that he loved me. Hmm. Yeah, so, I mean, we would, he would wake up every day and, and, and still say that. Yeah. You know, he woke up happy every day. You know, he didn't want to be remembered as the best, and he just really wanted to be remembered as a nice person. What did you lose the day Tony died? Well, I mean, the obvious thing is to say everything. I lost my North Star, but, you know, no, no reason to feel bad for me, though, because my life has been wonderful. And, uh, you know, I'll find a way to make sure it stays that way. It'll just be different forever. And I can smile because of Susan was wearing this watch, and I said, oh, where did you get that? And she said, Tony gave it to me. She said, in fact, he gave me everything. So that's kind of, that was a real love story. It started when she was 19, oh. 38 years. Um, what a lovely story. A beautiful interview. We'll be back after this. Because of you, there's a song in my
and get cooking with our friend Bobby Flay. Oh, can't wait. Plus, singer songwriter L. King stops by. And radio personalities, the Smith sisters, will tell us what to watch. Okay, y'all, it is Thursday, which What's means tomorrow. tomorrow? No, I'm Over a career spanning 35 years, Matt Damon has played a soldier at war. Why, why, why do I deserve to go? A thief on the Vegas Strip. Smash and grab job, huh? And an astronaut stuck on Mars. I'm still alive. Surprise. Now he finds himself at the center of a pivotal moment in history. How about because this is the most important thing to ever happen in the history of the world? In Oppenheimer, Damon is Leslie Groves Jr a real-life general in the United States Army, tasked with supervising scientist J. Robert Oppenheimer on the Manhattan Project, the secret operation to create the world's first atomic bomb, eventually used twice in Japan during World War II. Why don't you have a Nobel Prize? I had you a general. They're making me one for this. Perhaps I'll have the same luck. A Nobel Prize for making a bomb? Had you heard of the general? Did you know anything about him? No, I, I didn't know. I wasn't familiar with all the details and, and, and how kind of fraught this whole situation was with, you know, because of the, the, the differing philosophies, right? The military's, you know, very necessary need to compartmentalize and, you know, everything's on a need to know basis and, versus the scientists who share all their information because they're all about trying to get to the greater truth. And so they want to build on each other's work. And so, that is, that is, you know, obviously a kind of a natural source of tension for, you know, the military and the scientists coming together. That, and, and everybody was needed. I mean, the scale of this operation is just insane, uh, what they were able to do, the logistics of it. And that was really what Groves was good at. But, but I think it, it was like herding cats for him most of the time with the scientists because they just did not align philosophically. In a star-studded cast that includes Emily Blunt and Robert Truman Downey Jr., Jr. Irish actor Killian Murphy plays Oppenheimer, a genius haunted by his creation. Chances are near zero. Near zero. What do you want from theory alone? Zero would be nice. You guys get into, in the, in the film, I wonder if you thought about or talked with the other cast members about just this moral dilemma that's been debated for 80 years right. about using an atomic bomb, which is the one side says, we saved lives by using it. This would have been right. a years long war, a land invasion of Tokyo, et cetera, right. et cetera, et cetera. Right. The other side is it's it's a war crime. Right. And that's kind of at the heart of the, the tension for Oppenheimer anyway. Yeah, and, 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 and his cross to bear for the rest of his life, you know, that he brought this into existence. And um, it's such a big idea that, you know, we were both born into a world that had nuclear weapons. Yeah. You know what I mean? It, it's never, we've never, not lived in that world, you know, and it obviously raises a lot of questions about technologies we're continuing to develop, right? And, and what are our responsibilities to each other and to humanity? And, and, you know, when you start dealing with some of these existential technologies, where's the line? To create the film's stunning explosions, director Christopher Nolan did things the old fashioned way. Archer. Chris didn't use special effects for a lot of the stuff or any of the stuff you right. see. It's kind of like old school filmmaking where there's no CGI to it. Right. But That's, he pulls it off. Yeah, it's part of his, he's got an engineer's brain on top of being, it's, he's like this incredible mix of like left brain, right brain. He figures out a way to do it and a way to do it in camera. Um, and it's always better for the performances and it's always better for us if, you know, if it's all really happening and it's not, look at the tennis ball. You know, right. <laughs> oh, it's a big explosion. Ah, you know what I mean? That's always a little soul destroying. But, you know, with Chris, it's like he's going to blow it up, <laughs> you know? And when he does that in IMAX, it blows you through the back of the field. It blows you out the door. Like yeah, almost yeah, yeah. back into your chair, for yeah. sure. 
Oppenheimer comes in the same year for Damon as the hit movie Air, directed by Ben Affleck. You got a name for it? Air Jordan. What was it like to be directed by your best friend? It was great. It was great. It's like being directed by Chris. It's, uh, you know, great directors really give you the freedom. It's, it's a collaboration. It's a partnership. So we're definitely having an eye towards finding good stuff to do together. That's so cool to, to yeah. go back to your earliest days together. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Just be buddies. And, and when you were trying to scramble to get work, and, yeah. you know, that's, and I imagine you have a shorthand on set too, where oh, it just yeah. makes life well, easy. What's really great is there's no diplomacy. You know what I mean? And <laughs> yeah. like, you can waste so much time by trying to be polite and you, yeah. you know, in the movie business and, and in theater, they've you know, developed a whole vocabulary for how to talk to somebody and basically how to tell somebody they're sucking, <laughs> right? And like, we can just say you <laughs> suck. <laughs> so it's not, that was great, but what if we tried this? It's what like, if I'm wondering yeah. if uh, he feels a little more reserved <laughs> in this? Just tell me I'm overacting, you know what I mean? Where Ben and I grew up, you know, we'd take the subway places and- Damon and Affleck famously grew up two years and two blocks apart in Cambridge, Massachusetts, bonding over their love of writing and acting. It seems to me, just reading everything I could read about you, that you knew like really early on that this was it. Probably by the time I was 13, yeah. yeah. And like was very, taking it very seriously. And we had the best teacher, I think, in the world who came into our lives at that point. And he taught us how to write. He taught us how to write through improvisation because we would generate a lot of our own plays, exactly how Ben and I write now, and be these two kids who live a block and a half away from each other, like totally obsessed with, with acting and movies. And, and, you know, we never doubted that this is what we were going to do. Damon was 18 when he delivered a single line in his Let's first movie, Mystic Damon Pizza. Mom, you want my green stuff? before acclaimed roles in films like School Ties and Courage Under Fire. The captain was, was hurt pretty bad. Goodwill Hunting, the movie that changed his life, began as a writing assignment while Damon was studying at Harvard. You don't owe it to yourself. You owe it to me. I started in a playwriting class, but I handed it to Ben. And I was like, I, what do you think of this? He goes, I don't know what happens next, but we should do this together. And I went, great. I don't know what happens next either. And so we, we literally kind of didn't force it. And then one night we were sitting around and he just goes, because we had the scene where I show up in Robin Williams' office and kind of the first time I meet him and he ends up holding me against the, yeah. that's the five pages that survived. And we were sitting there, we hadn't talked about the script in months and Ben just goes out of the blue. He goes, you know, I don't think he'd tolerate like being talked to that way. I think he'd probably say something back and he'd probably say something like, and he started to talk and, and, and then we started going, and I went, oh my God, that's right. Okay, so, so we wrote that monologue that Robin does on the park bench. That was the second mm -hmm. thing we wrote. You don't know about real loss because it only occurs when you love something more than you love yourself. Scenes like that one earned Damon and Affleck an Academy Award for Best Screenplay. I just said to Matt, losing would suck and winning would be really scary, and it's really, really scary. As Goodwill Hunting and the endless list of hits that followed have made Damon one of the biggest stars in the world, he has managed off screen to live relatively quietly with wife Luciana and their four daughters, spending time on his nonprofit, Water.org, which provides clean drinking water and sanitation. I feel like if I'm good at anything, it's like picking partners because like between Ben and my wife and Gary White, who <laughs> we co-founded water.org together, like those are the three most significant partnerships in my life. And, and all those things are going really well. In so. which order, Matt? In which order are they most significant? Well, listen, <laughs> you're supposed to divide your day up right into thirds. So, uh, so, I, so there's no particular order. But obviously my wife. There you I'm, go. If you're gonna, That's why I was helping you oh, out yeah, there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was a layup. <laughs>
you so much, the city of Boston, and, 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 and God, I know we're forgetting somebody. Whoever we forgot, we love you, and we, we love you. you. Thank you, thank you so much. Standing on that stage at the Oscars, did you feel kind of victory for like scrappy young screenwriters, actors? Yeah, and, and to be fair, like we weren't the first people to do that. And like we had the example of Sylvester Stallone, but Stallone was like our kind of code word basically. Cause it was like, we read this story about him having like a few hundred bucks and he uh, turned down like 35 grand or something. They, Cause they were just trying to get him off the movie. Mm -hmm. Like, look, you wrote it, just go away, go away. And he just wouldn't do it. He wouldn't. And so we'd go into these meetings and these people would say, well, you guys can't play the parts. I mean, come on. You know, they wanted Brad and Leo, you know, right. it's like, you guys can't play the parts. And we were like Sylvester Stallone. <laughs> yes, we can. We can play the parts. We are playing the parts. With the perseverance of Rocky, the pair eventually got their movie made, but not without a big assist from famed director Francis Ford Coppola. We had A-list filmmakers pass on it because they wanted Brad and Leo and didn't want to risk it with us. And, and then I got The Rainmaker, and it was, I remember Francis said to me one day, oh, I got a call from Robin. I said, what? And he goes, Robin Williams called me. He was asking about you. And so he read the script, and he loved it. But he goes, who the hell are these guys? And Francis said, he's a, he's a great young actor. You should work with him. So and that, that was like, wow. yeah, so Francis vouched for me, and, and Robin took the part. What was it like the next day after the Oscars? Was it literally an overnight thing, walking outside and people go, you're Matt Damon in a way we, they never We had a before? really funny thing happen, actually, because we were shooting Dogma. We were in Pittsburgh. So Ben and I had to fly. The night after the Oscars, we had to fly a red eye to Pittsburgh from LA. And so we land at like, I don't know, seven or eight in the morning. And we come off the plane and there are like 30 people in the jetway at the gate waiting for us, cheering. And there was this kind of momentary hysteria. We're like, oh, can I have a picture? Yeah, and we, but Ben and I just sat and talked to everybody, you know, for 15 minutes or so. And then the way the Pittsburgh airport is, you, there's, a, there's a tram that you have to take. So we go and get on the tram. And by the time we're on the tram, we're on the tram with these 30 people. They've all completely lost interest in us. <laughs> and we're holding the thing and we're sitting there and Ben goes, can you believe this? He goes, <laughs> he goes, that was it. Oh, we got 15 minutes. <laughs> Damon and Affleck have stretched those 15 minutes into 25 years. And now they're out to change the movie business. Air was the first film from their production company, Artists' Equity, which aims to spread the wealth around the set. Well, the idea was that there's bloat on movie sets, but people don't really know where it is. They don't understand where it is, and we know where it is. And so we let every department run itself, and in the money that's saved, we, we share it and distribute it throughout the crew. So they're getting much more money, and they have autonomy and creative autonomy. And so the productions run incredibly efficiently, and, it, and it's just really worked. It was, um, it's been great. It's been really, really fun. You're exposing based on, what, 30-some years of experience, yeah. like flaws you see in the system. Right and getting people the money they deserve. It's disruptive. People are talking about it as a model, like a new model for I hope movies, so. You know? I mean, it would yeah. be nice if people got paid better, yeah. you know? Yeah, thank you, man. So oh, good sorry. to talk thank to you. you. I appreciate it.
Curry is famous for draining shots from long distance, but not usually this long. What's your target, Steph? I'm going to hit it at the... Uh, Far? It's going to be a little fade that's going to land on it. Clearly, you're playing a lot based on what I saw in Tahoe. I, I, I want to thank the Los Angeles Lakers <laughs> for their contributions to me winning my golf tournaments this summer because I got a four-week head start on golf training camp. In his day job with the Golden State Warriors, Curry has won four championships and a pair of league MVP awards. Considered by most to be the greatest shooter in NBA history, Curry has revolutionized the game while calmly launching shots from previously preposterous spots on the floor. Do you have an appreciation for the fact that 14-year-old boys take two dribbles inside half court and jack up threes because of you, <laughs> that you have truly changed the way basketball is played. Yeah, it's hard to have, like really reflect on it, but I understand even just at the highest level of professional basketball in the league, you know, how teams have shifted their strategies around, how guys have added that as a, a skill set of theirs, the way that they see the game. It was never a, like an intention of like, that's what I'm here to do, but it's just how I see the game and the irrational confidence that I have to shoot all those type of shots. <laughs> the one thing for the young next generation is like, I want them to have the vision of being able to shoot the same shots. I want them to have the confidence that, you know, they can play the game that way, but uh, just got to put the work in and have the patience that it'll, it'll, you can keep stacking blocks to get to that level. Stephen, good job, good job. Curry grew up a small, skinny kid in the shadow of his dad, Del Curry, another smooth shooter who played most of his NBA career with the Charlotte Hornets. I'm constantly trying to find the space just to be able to survey my life. Steph's story is the subject of the new Apple TV Plus documentary, Stephen Curry, Underrated. There's a shot in there of you I don't know, are you 10 years uh, old or something like nine time, years old, yeah. sitting at the end of the bench, the very end of the bench, biting your fingernails, and it freezes on you, and I'm like, that kid's gonna be Steph Curry? <laughs> Growing up in Charlotte, where my dad played for 10 years for the Charlotte Hornets, you would think that, you know, what came with that was like an easy path towards, you know, just being the best player on every, on every team that you are. I had the exact opposite experience. So kind of a weird kind of contrast to what expectations could have been, but what, you know, naysayers and critics, even at that time, um, were saying about, you know, I, I just wasn't ready for that level. And it developed an identity around, you know, work ethic and, and your inner confidence in yourself that when you're out there, you know, take advantage of every opportunity and you know, don't be afraid of failure. There's a perseverance and patience that comes with it as well that it's not just a basketball story. It's not just a sports story. It's something uh, that I encourage anybody to find what makes you different, what makes you unique, what you have to offer the world at whatever level um, and own it and, and pour everything you have into it. So that underrated mindset is always a part of my DNA, no matter mm -hmm. what's what's happened um, you know, in my NBA career and my life. I still carry that you know, with me. When Curry wasn't recruited by any of the colleges where he dreamed of playing, he accepted an offer from coach Bob McKillop at Davidson College, not far from home. You credit coach McKillop, who believed in you and gave you a chance, even though you struggled in that first game as a freshman. How much credit does he deserve for the man sitting here today? A lot, um, just in terms of from the time he started recruiting me, uh, the message was, you know, that I was, I was good enough. Like I didn't have to change. Uh, he was gonna, you know, try to unlock my full potential. He's gonna push me. It wasn't gonna be easy, but, um, you know, I truly believe that he had my best interest in, in knowing that I could add a lot of value to the Davidson program. He had uh, some probably doubts creep in the, my first college game where I had 13 turnovers. And the footage of that game was worse than I actually remember. <laughs> I it was, uh, if I'm a coach and I'm watching that <laughs> performance, uh, I'm making a quick substitution and, and moving on. But Coach McKillop, he stuck with me and he instilled confidence in me through those failures. And it wasn't just me as the basketball player, it was me as the man as well. And he, he coached and, and mentored both. And so I feel like um, that decision to go there, play for him, and those three years that I had there were 
you know, the most formative years uh, of my basketball career. Curry became a national star while leading Davidson on a magical run through the 2008 NCAA tournament, falling just two points shy of an improbable Final Four. Curry turned pro after his junior year. When did you feel like you had arrived in the NBA, that you, had to, that you weren't proving yourself anymore? It was probably my fourth year. Uh, we had a game in, in New York at the Garden, and it was, I scored 54 points, but we lost that night. And it was the first time, really, that my confidence is an unbelievable unlock in, in, in anything, especially on the basketball court. And people started to talk about you a little different once I had... Uh, had that night and I think it just gave me a boost. I already knew that I was, you know, capable, but I think that the tone trying to, you know, started to change a little bit and then from there there's a little failure on the back end of that. That next year we had lost in the playoffs um, against the Clippers in seven game series and we were still tapping on the door trying to get to the next to the uh, to the mountaintop of, of being a championship contender but that game specifically just kind of changed the narrative okay we got to take this kid seriously uh, because he's got game and he's fearless and uh, I appreciate that little stamp of validation uh, but I knew that there was a little bit more work that needed to be done it's funny what a big night at the garden can do isn't yeah, it absolutely the whole world notices absolutely I heard you say and I was surprised to hear it that you still feel a little underrated how can that be when people talk about you as maybe the greatest player who ever lived? <laughs> Certainly right now, you and LeBron, how could you still be underrated? It's, it's a tough one to explain because of what the resume looks like, but for me, it's like the healthy insecurity of the way that I've seen my, you know, the game of basketball and life from day one uh, has not changed at all. I still want to enjoy every opportunity that I have. There's a lot of gratitude and appreciation for you know, what I've been able to accomplish, but I still have that I have to prove to myself that I can still do it and I can still do it or I can still do it for as long as I can. And, you know, that's what drives me. And maybe it's something that I can, you know, trick yourself into every year knowing like, all right, you have success, but it's, it's what have you, you know, what have you done lately type of mentality that you have to kind of keep living up to. And if I don't have that underrated DNA come out and that drive me in terms of how I prepare for the next season or how I prepare for, you know, a big a big game throughout the regular season or a big playoff run. Um, I won't be myself. And so, yeah, that's the best way to explain it. And mm -hmm. knowing that that underrated mindset is, again, a part of, you know, just who I am and it oozes out of me at, at every, at every, um, every opportunity. I imagine part of it too is people keep writing off, your, not just you, but your team. I'm watching the film and remembering every time you would lose a playoff series. The dynasty's over. That's it. It's over. They're too old. Break up the band. Let's move on. And then you'd win another championship. Why do you think people keep doing that, making the same mistake of counting you guys out? I don't know, man. I know, you know, once you're successful um, and you you got the target on your back at, at a certain point, people want to see, you know, see you lose almost in a sense. I feel like that's kind of the nature, unless you're in Dub Nation or out in the Bay Area and you're a true Warriors fan. So. Um, it's just a part of the nature of, you know, of, of, of winning and, you know, once you show a little sign of, of vulnerability or like you're, you, you lost your powers, I think that's what, you know, we've thrived on um, and we're in that position right now trying to reestablish who we are at the top of the league and especially our core being still together. It's an amazing opportunity to tap into that, you know, for, for one more run uh, to see if we can get back there.
In recent years, Curry has extended his range to include the film production company Unanimous Media, the underrated golf and basketball tours for disadvantaged kids, and the Eat, Learn, Play Foundation he created with his wife Aisha. Do you have moments, Steph, now where you go, I can't believe the skinny kid biting his nails on the end of the bench got to where he got? All the time. Do you? All the time. I think that's a part of just being able to stay in the moment and like really enjoy you know what's right in front of you. Um, we've, we've tried to maintain that as much as possible because I just have so much fun playing this game. I think if we lose that sense of gratitude or you know that wonder of what's happened, um, that would kind of rob you of the joy as well because mm. it's, just, it's truly special. You play with a smile on your face and you're running around like crazy and you're hiding behind screens and sneaking out and turning around when you shoot a three. Does that just come naturally to you, that joy that you wear? Because it's fun to watch as a fan and it's a good example for kids playing the game. Yeah, it, it's, it came natural early. I vowed and been very intentional about um, bringing joy to every environment that I go into because I feel like, you know, that's what helps me kind of again tap into the moment, uh, not be afraid of, of you know whatever expectations might be now, or you know again that fear of failure. Of you know, uh, if I'm having fun, that means I'm going to work. It means I'm going to enjoy coming to practice. That means I'm going to enjoy you know the sacrifices that it takes to be successful at this level. Um, and that's my happy place out there. Oh, step away from the ball just a little bit, yeah. and then more, more. Yeah. It almost feel, it might feel like you're squatting, yeah. but that right there. Yeah. Golf tips with Steph Curry. Okay. That first year in retirement, that's what I'm gonna be. I'm gonna be like an amateur swing coach. Yeah. <laughs> You'll find me on like any range. I'm just walking down the aisle like, all right. Yeah. So you've got a couple years left on your contract. You're 35 right yes, now. Sir. Um, LeBron's 38. He'll be pushing 40 here pretty soon. Brady played till he was 45. Do you see the end anytime soon? I mean, you're playing at a very high level, but do you start thinking that way at this point? As you, you do start thinking about it. It almost puts into perspective how important these next, you know, two, three years are in terms of, you know, doubling down on the level that I want to be at and continue to play at um, and, and pushing it you know, to the limit as, as long as I can. You can learn lessons from, you know, guys like that, that it is possible. Obviously, you have to be mindful of, of how you approach, you know, your off seasons and, you know, uh, the work that you put in on your body to make sure you can stay at that level. And I'm doing all those things to, to give myself a chance to be successful. But uh, I, I just love the fact that the timeline almost just gives me much more motivation for the now mm. to take advantage of every opportunity that I had. Because you know the ball is going to stop bouncing at some point. Uh, I just don't think it's anytime soon. Okay, this is our conference room. Believe it or not, this was my dining table. Is that true? <laughs> it is true. You really are a scrappy organization. <laughs> Scarlett Johansson has been scrappy from the start. On screen. <laughs> and now in business, with the launch of her skincare line, The Outset. I want to talk about The Outset a lot. <laughs> I'm here for the eye cream.
Great. And Joe, as I understand it. <laughs> That's how it's commonly known as, yeah. <laughs> but let's start, if we can, with Asteroid City. Sure. Which is an amazing Wes Anderson film. Beautiful to look at, as all of his stuff is. My word, it's hot. Johansson plays Midge Campbell, a 1950s movie star forced to quarantine in the fictional desert town of Asteroid City. You were very good in the one about the tramp in the brothel Thank who you. gets amnesia and Thank becomes you. a pediatrician. You were very authentic. Actually, maybe my favorite character I've ever I don't know why it. nobody else liked it. Oh. So what is that phone call like when Wes says, not only do I want you in the movie, but I wrote a part for you? It's like a career dream goal, um, definitely. I was very excited to read a script in its entirety of his, which I'd never had the chance to do. And it was in the middle of COVID, the, right in the middle of COVID. So I was not expecting to get any calls about work. I'd sort of, you know, just kind of had taken a bit of a pause, I guess. It was a, it was a, it was a time that felt all over the place. And so I, yeah, I, I read the script and I, I play a few different characters in this film. So I play an actor who's playing an actor who's also preparing a play. Um, so it has, it's, there was a lot to discuss. I had to wrap my head around. I don't like the way that guy looked at us, the alien. Well, how did he, how did he look Like at we're us? doomed. Maybe we are. As with every Wes Anderson movie, there may be no point exactly into asking what it's about because it's kind of an experience, but how do you describe this film to people who are thinking about going to see it? The film is really a sort of exploration in existentialism. It's, I think, a film that's made, it's very reflective of where Wes is at, I think, in his life and career. You know, the, the fact that it was written and developed during the quarantine time um, is definitely baked in there. Um, it's very self-reflective. And I think it's also a celebration of creativity and the nomadic circus that actors create around themselves. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that is something that I think it comes up in Wes's work a lot, that real fondness and celebration of that environment. So how do you describe the Wes Anderson experience. It's so cool to look at, obviously, and fun to watch. All of his films are. But on the other side of it, as an actor, what does that mean? How is it different from other things you've done? Well, I, I think Wes's love of that nomadic circus is really, you know, a, it's also represented in how in the environment that he creates on set. We were very isolated um, in a town called Chinchon, which is in Spain in an agricultural area, you know, really l never left our, our compound um, where we were all staying. And this whole world was created on a watermelon farm. Um, so all the earth and all the, all the mountains and everything were brought in and built this practical set in the middle of nothing and you know just agricultural land and so it just it was very surreal but also so magical i mean you would it was so unique i've never experienced i mean i'd say doing theater is maybe the closest thing that i would could describe it to liken it to it was it was it's such a beautiful family that he that he surrounds himself with of of you know family he chooses so let's talk about midge specifically mm -hmm. You read her on the page. Did you get her right away? What did you think about the character? I, I actually had to read it a couple of times. Um, my character, Midge, is a, she is a, you know, movie star. Um, she is beloved. She is kind of narcissistic and self-involved um, in, a, I think, a way that's kind of, it, that's, very um, alluring and enigmatic. And um, she's aware that she's constantly being watched. You know, that's just an ingredient in her life that's always there. And, and she doesn't mind that at all. And she's, you know, I, we looked at just what actors I could kind of hang my hat on and, um, you know, of that era whose career could we emulate. And um, I think Betty Davis was yeah. who we both liked. And I just... Love her, I love her whole spirit and 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 
her vulnerability, her strength, her groundedness. Like she feels to me, you know, very authentic. And, um, and so that's who we kind of base her on. So yeah. th this role came to you at a complicated time was, for you as well, <laughs> to say the least. It wasn't, it, well, it wasn't initially that complicated. <laughs> initially it was wide open and great, but as we waited for the window of time to shoot because of COVID and all the regulations, um, you know, I, I, I got pregnant, um, and I was very happy to be pregnant, but I, I knew that, you know, I had this obligation to shoot this film and, and, uh, nonetheless, I, at some point had to tell Wes that I was pregnant because I thought, I, you know, I guess this couldn't, maybe isn't going to push for as long as I need it to. And, um, in, in true West fashion, he was so excited that I was pregnant. He said, how long do you think you're going to need post, you know, post birth? And I said, I don't know, maybe like, I guess eight weeks or something. So on my eight week postpartum date, I was flying to Spain and with my young, you know, eight week old baby and Colin. And, um, so that was another wow. added piece to the experience that was so, it was wonderful. I mean, it was so wonderful. It was, it was challenging, but it was also completely unexpected. And, you know, I felt so fortunate and grateful to be able to, to still be able to participate, you know, and then I got to bring my infant baby to the table and could be held by Adrian Brody and Willem Dafoe and <laughs> Brian Cranston and everybody else. So. The stories he will have, his earliest <laughs> babysitters, all Academy Award winners. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Johansson's own story begins in New York's Greenwich Village, where she grew up with dreams of starring in the Broadway musicals she saw with her mother. She began to audition and landed her first film role at just nine years old in Rob Reiner's North. After working steadily as a child actress, Johansson was thrust into adult stardom by her performance alongside Bill Murray in the acclaimed 2003 movie, Lost in Translation. I just don't know what I'm supposed to be. I forgot how young you were when you made that. I mean, 17, you're just, you're a high school kid, basically yeah. being thrust into this world. Was that a hard thing to have that many eyes on you and to be treated now as an adult effectively after that movie? I mean, I think just being that age is hard anyway. I felt like I was at a crossroads at that time because I, you know, Lost in Translation had come out and Girl with a Pearl Earring and I did some very exciting work, but then I felt like the work that was out there for me anyway was not, it just it was sort of uninspired and I didn't know I thought, oh, I can't, I don't want to do work that's uninspiring. I would rather do another, some other thing. She found the fire again on Broadway, starring and winning a Tony Award in the 2010 revival of A View from the Bridge. Which sort of brings it full circle, the song and dance and the performance in your living room with your family. Yeah. Not only to come to Broadway and do Arthur Miller, but to win a Tony Award. That must have been thrilling. It was thrilling. Our production was so incredibly received and feel totally welcomed by this amazing community I admired for my entire life and feel that thrill of being on stage every night and the unexpected, you know, have that, oh, it just, it's so exciting and makes you feel like alive, you know? And then it's the same year, I think it's the same year as the play that um, Black Widow and Iron Man 2 come along, right? Right. By a twist of fate, all of a sudden, now you're in the Marvel Universe. So yeah. you're at this crossroads where you're like, I don't know what I'm doing, <laughs> to winning a Tony, and now you're in a Marvel movie, and then a bunch that came after that. Right. What did the Marvel movies do to your career and your life, just in terms of like joining this world that people are so invested in and so many people are aware of and watch it? Yeah. How much fun was that to be a part of? I didn't know whether... I would be accepted by the, you know, by the, this massive fan base that was already there. It was so early days in that genre. I mean, the way that it was then, it was just the beginning. I mean, we were on the set of Avengers going, this is either going to be, we're having an amazing time with all these incredible actors and yet we don't, you know, this could be right. really <laughs> awful. I mean, it's so crazy. You have, I remember going, there's a Nordic god, we have a mutant, this like rich playboy turned robot guy. I'm a Russian spy. It was just like, this is, 
a recipe for disaster. Somebody that's been frozen in ice and comes up. It's like, but then here we are. So this is home. Yeah, that's the home away from home. When Johansson is not on set, she's here in the offices of The Outset, the skincare company she co-founded just over a year ago. This is our like best selling okay. sort of trio. It's our cleanser, our prep serum, and our daily moisturizer. I'm just realizing I don't do enough. I have no yeah. night creams. What? I don't have. No. But you're on camera all the I time. I know. I know. I need to get more serious about my career. Well, I know. <laughs> So what compelled you to take on this challenge? Since I was probably 12, 13 years old, have struggled with acne. And when I was younger, it was all about sort of stripping away your skin and, you know, basically resurface your entire face. Right. And at some point I, you know, I was like, I have to kind of just stop everything and just try something else, which was just using very clean moisturizing products and stop like stripping everything away. And that's when my skin completely transformed. Mm. So is it true that um, Colin is a big proponent of the eye cream? Yes. That's his thing? Colin was our eye cream mm -hmm. connoisseur. I never used eye cream before and <laughs> Colin uses it every day. And so I thought, well, why don't, since, you know, it was during COVID and I didn't have so many people to test it on in my, <laughs> Colin became our, our eye cream expert. Wow. And um, I got him to switch to the outset eye cream. So. And he looks great. He's never looked better. <laughs> so youthful. He is. He's like de-aging. It's very annoying. Look at you. You're doing it all. And with a toddler at home. I mean, it's all very impressive. I mean, I'm sure I left like the <laughs> oven on or whatever. But, yeah. The story of Niall Horan's life is one of an Irish teenager thrust to worldwide fame as a member of the biggest group on the planet. Let's go crazy, crazy, crazy till we see the sun. Horan and his bandmates in One Direction flew to the top of the charts, filling stadiums around the world 
and selling more than 70 million albums. I remember thinking, right, I've just been through the craziest thing that could possibly happen to someone. And he was not certain about what was waiting on the other side of that dizzying phenomenon. Scary prospect, obviously, coming off the back of the band. I just had to keep it going. I wanted to make music and just had to trust it. That trust has paid off in a successful solo career. Purin's latest album is called The Show, a record created when he finally was forced to slow down. So it's the summer of 2020. Take me back to that time for you. Mm. And you're trying to put out new music. You've just had your second album come out in March of that year. True, yeah. And you're getting ready to go on a tour. Mm -hmm. Of course, everything is canceled, <laughs> except you don't have your instruments. All my gear was locked away. We were just about to go on tour in that, that April. All my guitars had left my house. They were all boxed up in a lockup somewhere, ready to go to the first show. And it was just me and the, the piano and in the house. <laughs> So when you sat down at that piano, were you doing that to start to write a new album or was that just something to sort of pass the time and get through this bizarre moment? Well, I'm always kind of just like noodling anyway. You know, you just kind of sit down there and play around, sing some melodies, play some chords and hope for the best. And then if it doesn't come, it doesn't come. That's when, when I wrote that and sung the first couple of lines and the lyrics came out. I was like, oh, maybe this is the time now. And this is, maybe this is the start of a record. If everything was easy, nothing ever broke. If everything was simple, how would we know? The show is the title. Let's start there. What does that mean? What is the show? Well, it didn't mean anything until I wrote the song, the show. The lyric in the, in the song, the show, is basically me saying how grateful I should feel for everything. Because during the pandemic, we kind of lost all of that control that we like, like to have as humans. The show then became a metaphor for, for life in my head. Like, you know, the different acts mm -hmm. throughout. And then straight away, once I'd written that song, I realized, all right, well, there's a title for a record. And now that title provokes thoughts, you know, that make up the different spokes of the wheel of life. Mm. And, and that's kind of where it started from. There's a, at a weightiness or in mm. some of the subject matter is heavy despite the sort of some of pop sound to some of it anyway. Is that fair to say? Yeah, I think it's very fair. Um, there's, there's a weightiness to it um, in a different way than my previous stuff. Like I tend to be the guy that writes the, the, the breakup songs and uh, I literally, my last album was called Heartbreak Weather. Yep. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I've tend to been that guy, but when there's no heartbreak, the, the subject matter changes and what was going on in the world. I just gotten into a new relationship, so that was good. But then there was the other side of things where the weight of the world that was 2020 and the time I was writing down notes, you know, that's what was going on on the planet. Um, I tend to try and write with a bit of weight, but my songs always seem to have some sort of like a silver lining to them. Mm -hmm. I tend to try and have like, as dark as they sound, I try and make them have a bit of uplift and a bit of, a bit of hope somewhere along the line. You're a big vinyl guy? Yeah. Yeah. I think it's because of all I grew up on. The 29-year-old Porin grew up in Mullingar, Ireland, about an hour outside of Dublin. He was raised on bands like the Eagles and Fleetwood Mac and taught himself to play the guitar. I probably didn't properly start playing until I was probably 10, 11 maybe. There was a guitar in the house that I was given to a, as a gift to someone and they never played it. So it was like this little nylon stringed yeah. kind of Spanishy type guitar and it was just sitting around and I would like was at the start of like the broadband dial-up connection <laughs> so when everyone was not using the landline <laughs> I was like sitting on YouTube and I never I was still to this day I never had a guitar lesson or anything like this but Is that I, would, right? like, I would sit on YouTube watch songs that I liked like guys playing covers on them on YouTube and like pause when they'd like set their fingers really on the frets Wow. And just like see where their fingers were. So to this day, I couldn't tell you more than about six chords. <laughs> At 16 and with no formal training, Horan was convinced by his high school French teacher to audition for the British singing competition, The X Factor. I think you're unprepared. I think you came with the wrong song. 
You're not as good as you thought you were. Despite a rocky start, the judges put Horan through, later teaming him up with Louis Tomlinson, Zayn Malik, Liam Payne, and Harry Styles to form One Direction. They finished in third place, but that was just the beginning. What makes you beautiful? Went number one first week, and then there was a bit of noise around Europe, and we went over to Europe, and it was like thousands of screaming girls in the streets of Amsterdam and Milan and, you know, Berlin and places like this, and it was like, what's going on? We were just on like a network TV show a couple of weeks ago. And then, uh, then it started, a bit of noise started coming from over here, and then it just snowballed, and it, it snowballed very fast. And um, the rest is history, I suppose. <laughs> yeah. So how does a teenage boy, and you were boys, how do you begin to wrap your head around what's happening? You come from a humble place, you've got your family and friends who mean so much to you, and all of a sudden, the streets are filled with people screaming your name. How do you begin to cope with that? Everyone was just in a state of shock the whole time. Like, looking at the first billboard in Times Square, you're like, Times Square? I've seen that in the movies, <laughs> you know? There's always a bit of like, where are we? How, how, how do we do this? I think that was what was attracted a lot of people to the band. I think it was very clear that it was five working class blue collar kids who were just the deer in the headlights and are now like these worldwide known people. We have to remember, we, it was us, our team, our bubble around us, and we just kind of went from place to place worldwide and just kind of went along with it. If you're looking in, it must have looked crazy. You know, and everyone's going, you're the biggest band. And we were just kind of just still having a great time. And just, yeah. we always used to say like, nor normal people doing an abnormal job, um, which is a, a good outlook to have. Um, remember one, one of the stadium tours was called Where We Are Tour. Because we always used to be like, look where we are. <laughs> it was literally named. Because we were just always like, oh, what that's the hell is going on? <laughs> And every time, every now and then, you catch yourself just like looking at each other, just going, "This is nuts!" Like on stage at like the MetLife or the Garden, or you know, you'd have a moment every now and then. It's just like, "This is nuts." Thankfully, that's never gotten old. I love it. You keep that wonder about you. Yeah. Anybody who knows you says you're obviously an extraordinary artist, but you you've kept your you're a normal guy. You know, you can sit and have a pint and jump in there and sing karaoke. <laughs> is that just? Your foundation, your family, your friends, just keeping grounded in all of that. You just have to have the right people around you and keep friends and family close and and don't let any infiltrations or anything like that happen. And then just yeah, just be yourself. Um, I think people can people can see through the, the mm. BS sometimes. As you look back on it now, these years later, does it feel like a dream or something? Or how do you look at it now as a I think I've been able man. to I think I think that was what was important about the pandemic for me too. It was, as I said, it was the first time I'd sat still. With that comes reflection and like just actually sitting, think, sitting and just going like, what's just happened for the last 10 years? This is the first time I've actually had to like think about the achievements and the tours and the, the fact that I can say that we played like two years of stadiums is <laughs> just nuts. Not many people can say that at all. In the, most, in the most humble way, I say that. So having that period to just like sit back and be like, oh my God, it does, it nearly feels like it's a, like a separate life now that I'm like a bit older and a bit, you know, I've solved the world now. Like, <laughs> I've, um, I'm so mature now. You're but a wise is, man. Yeah, yes. but I definitely have a wiser, like in a, a good outlook on things looking back. I didn't lose the plot along the way. <laughs> I'm not a Hollywood horror story. Right, right. <laughs> Oren has imparted some of that wisdom during his first season as a coach on The Voice, where he won the competition with singer Gina Miles. You are unbelievable. How much fun has that been for you? Oh, it's been great. Like, I was nervous going into it, you know, having come from a show like that. Right. I was like, do I want to go back into something like that? I've never mentored anyone before, but it's, it was the best decision I made. It's so much fun. I bet you have incredible empathy for the people on that 
oh, yeah. side of it, having been there before. For sure, yeah. I know exactly what it's like to stand there and like have your future in some famous bloke's hand, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And I'm the, I'm the famous dude with, my, <laughs> with the future in the hand. <laughs> albums under his belt, Horan has shown he can stand alone, away from the boys in the band. Went back to London and I just, I just had to trust that, I guess the biggest thing for me was, I knew I could write a song, how good was the next question. I had a, a fan base that if I was to release something, there was a, a fan base there to receive in some shape or form. You know, some people would hang on to it and some people wouldn't, whatever it may be. I just had to kind of trust that I could write a song and that if I was to release something, some people would be there to take it on. How long it was going to last, again, we don't, we never know. You had the advantage of a built-in fan base, as you said, but also it seems to me the challenge of some people wanting to just put you in that box and mm. say, they're boy banders, that mm. was a moment in time. Mm. You had to prove yourself. Yeah, for sure, yeah. I think there's, just, there's always a level of trying to prove yourself. Like, it's so competitive out there. It's not easy to just go and like write a song, release it, and just be convinced that it's just going to do well. Like that's never a guarantee ever. It's still not. Um, but you, there's definitely a, an element of right. I'm going to put my best foot forward here, try and give everything I can in performances, be myself in interviews, and then the rest is just like up to the people. Mm. It's the great thing about music these days is that power is in the people's hands. They'll make the decisions on whether you stick around or not. And then hopefully you write a good song here and there. <laughs> and there's a bit of longevity to it. Um, I've been doing it for, what is it, 14 years now. I really hope it doesn't stop anytime soon. <laughs> no, I think you're in good shape, my friend. I think it's good. Yeah. <laughs> It is hard work being John Luther, the good cop with a dark side, played for more than a decade now by Idris Elba. Because I'm ready. It looks like a lot of fun as a viewer to play this character. Nope. 
No? no. Just brutal because you're getting beat up so much? Getting up at 4 a.m. <laughs> in the rain, cold. <laughs> and, you know, I'm just like, can we do a Luther where he's uh, in Hawaii? <laughs> and there's like, you know, uh, maybe it's a tropical storm, so there is some rain, <laughs> but not so cold. I smell a sequel. 100%. Hawaii. 100%. Yeah. <laughs> Luther, Luther in Jamaica. <laughs> I mean, I say it isn't fun. I've played him for 10 years and he's yeah. one of my, you know, sort of dearest characters, if you like. Elba has played several. In this country, he is known best, perhaps, as drug dealer Stringer Bell from the iconic HBO drama, The Wire. No matter what we call heroin, it's going to get sold. But in Elba's native UK, Luther looms large. The popular five-season BBC series now spun into the new movie, Luther, The Fallen Son. For me, playing a detective on the other side of the fence, you know, Stringer on as a drug dealer, and Detective Luther, for me, that was like, yeah, I get to reinvent something, and myself, actually. And um, there's something about Luther being this forthright character that will stop at nothing. Mr. DCI John Luther, well, I mean, it's not. I, um, I was a DCI in your department. John Luther is an ordinary detective with sort of extraordinary circumstances, but very relatable, you know? We're not talking about end-of-the-world crime. We're talking about guys that have real bad sort of ethics, you know what mm -hmm. I mean? And he, he can't stand that. But what the film has now given us is taking this central character Luther, and putting him in these landscapes, in these scenarios uh, that could be as epic as the ones that James Bond sort of covers, you know what I mean? And I hope people kind of go, oh, wow, James versus John, you know what I mean? Like, I really hope that. Don't think I didn't notice. There's a moment at a bar, you're sitting there. I'd say a long day calls for a martini. Yeah. Whiskey. I remember seeing that in the script and was like, <laughs> Are we sure, bro? I mean, this is like, it's right on the nose. Was that a nod to the outside calls for you to play James Bond? Not purposely, but you know, <laughs> I think uh, those who know, know. It's a great moment. So now you've, you've certainly raised the question then com with the Bond comparison, the franchise anyway, of sequels. Mm. It feels to me, having just watched the movie, like there's more to come. Yeah. Fair to say, or at least that's the way you'd like it to go? Uh, I think it's fair to say that, yeah. I think that the ending, again, really sort of opens that door for what are the possibilities. Where does John go next? And I think that's quite on purpose. Yeah. Um, I think we all, you know, have a sort of wish to take a, a few chapters and, and see this landscape grow and grow. I, I do. I mean, I feel like there's so much we can offer. Because Lutherland is really wherever Luther goes. Mm. So if, if we saw Luther in Colombia and it had that same sort of Luther aesthetic and it's dark, you know, I think that would still be as engaging as seeing him in sort of London as we know it. Elba was born and raised in London's working class Canning Town, the son of African immigrants. How and when was the seed to become an actor planted? How did you get to that place from a place that was so far from Hollywood or show business? Well, I mean, you know, I, I, I knew in high school, secondary school for, for me, that I wanted to be an actor. I knew that at the age of 16, that this was sort of my career path. I just didn't know how to get there. And as soon as I left school, I sort of, you know, got into college. And I sort of did a performing arts course, which sort of covered all the bases. But it was right there when I sort of got introduced to method acting and Robert De Niro. I just became fixated. So I was 19 after two years college, you know, I worked with my dad. My dad worked at Ford's Motor Company. I worked with him for a little bit. And then I saved enough money and I was like, I'm going to New York. And everyone's going, all my friends were like, you're going where? What? New York? What's in New York? Who do you know? I was like, my career's in New York. I want to go to New York. And it's like, it's like <laughs> you're not even acting. You're not even an actor yet. You want to go to New York? Good luck. And it, yeah. wasn't, it wasn't easy for many, many years. Yeah. Finding jobs, you were... DJing and bouncing and paying your rent and doing yeah. all the things you had to do to yeah. survive. So what were those early years in America like for a young struggling actor? You know, I think I'd saved up somewhere like 36,000 pounds and used it all within six months. Mm -hmm. 
and I was broke and I was not booking jobs. Casting directors were interested, but not really. Mm. You know what I mean? Like, don't come to a place where they already have hamburgers. You have to come with something <laughs> different. Okay? So there's really good actors here. But I just came with this dream and then I was really, I'm, I'm a tenacious guy, you know, I stick at it. And so is it true that when the script for The Wire came your way, you were in the Astro van? Is there any truth <laughs> to that? Yeah. You were spending a few nights in the van? Yeah, yeah. It was a, it was a very tough time. I was married at the time and, and uh, my wife and I were going through a very bad time. You know, she was pregnant. It was just a rough time. Mm. I could barely scrape enough money for our, you know, unborn child. And I lived in a van for a little bit. Uh, but at the time, I was auditioning during the day. And... You know, my daughter was due to be born sort of like early January. And we're talking about November now. And this script comes in. It's like, you know, this is a pilot. You know, again, I was seeing really good casting directors by this junction, okay? This pilot's come in. It's called The Wire. Go in and see the guys. But do yourself a favor. Don't speak in your own accent. You know, just keep it uh, American. And I, I did. And quite frankly, I, it was... The moment that my daughter was born, I literally got the phone call that, hey, you know, we want to offer you the role. The same day. Bell. Yeah, exactly the same day. Yeah. I don't know if you believe in fate, but there was something going on that I, day. I mean, of course I do. That's of incredible. Do. It, was it's a, incredible. it was a really special time. Changed my life. Changed my, my daughter's life, you know. What did that mean to you professionally then when that show became such an iconic series and such a success and everyone knew your name and your face and you weren't this close anymore, you were there. Yeah. What did that mean as you went forward in your career? You know, it just restored my faith, man. Like that's yeah. bottom line, you know what I mean? It's really easy to sort of sort of have no faith, but when when stuff's really tough and you're just, you know, should I give up or shouldn't I? Hmm. Don't give up. As, as bleak as it's my, and honestly, that story, you couldn't get any more bleak than that. You know what I mean? Like, I have a child coming, I'm broke, I'm living in, a, in America, in New York City. And then, you know, there it came. So it meant a lot to me. It was a life changer. Um, it changed my life financially, obviously, but it really did catapult my career into essentially, you know, what I'm, I'm still dining of that, that life changing moment. Right. I mean, why work harder than you should? <laughs> no, I... Whether you're talking about The Office or Mandela... A just shell in the whole of South Africa. Luther, of course, and all these amazing series mm. and going to the Marvel Cinematic Universe <laughs> um, and getting all these opportunities. Talk about night and day where you couldn't... You couldn't find couldn't a job. Book. And now all yeah. of a sudden it's like, we want you to be in all these Marvel movies. Yeah. It's got to be sort of a head trip to say, I can sort of have my choice now of things that I want to do. Definitely, yeah. Someone asked me the other day, like, do you still audition? And I was like, no. Like, it was, <laughs> it was like an arrogant moment. I was just like, no, I don't audition ever, you know? Um, it, it's a very, very different scenario now. Have yeah. you ever had a chance to tell De Niro how he inspired you? You know what? No. Oh, we got to make that happen. I know. I, I mean, I, I've said it in so many interviews, and I was like, well, I'm going to meet De Niro. And she's like, dude, you, you actually inspired me. You know, he had a, an office down in... Um, Tribeca. Tribeca. Yeah. I, I literally fanboyed out one day and just went to his <laughs> office. And uh, I think he... I had read in the stage that he was... Um, the, the, the stage newspaper. Mm -hmm. That he was holding auditions for a, a Bronx Tale. It was his film he was directing. Yeah, and I was yeah. like, I, I gotta be in this, you know what I mean? I gotta find a way to be right. in it. And uh, so I show up and I said, Oh, I've got an audition at the front desk. And they're like, He goes, Yeah, go up to the next floor. So now I know I'm blagging this, right? I'm like, Wow, I'm going <laughs> up to the next floor. This must be where Bob De Niro is. And this woman comes out and she's like, Hi, who are you? I said, oh, uh, my name's Idris, uh, here's my resume. She's like, how did you get in this building? I said, oh, I'm auditioning for a Bronx Tale. She's like, honey, we already did the auditions. I'm just curious to know how you got in here. Ooh. I was like, um, well, I just did some research and I, I hustled it. She's like, wow, you got some nuts on you, boy. I tell you, I have to. Um, 
okay, I'll take your resume, uh, but we don't have any more auditions. Wow. See you later. Wow. True story. Wow. And I was like, okay. You know, it would be fun if we went down there right now and did that again. <laughs> I'm here to see Bob. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> Elba also is an accomplished DJ who has booked Coachella twice and one royal wedding. His other passion started as a side hustle long before acting paid the bills. We play a song and there's 5,000 people, hands in the air. That energy, you can't get that in films. You can get that maybe in theater, but it's not as reactive. When it's working, it's incredible. Mind you, when it's not working, like, <laughs> Do you even have nights like that? Even yeah. though they go, oh, Idris Elba's here, that's great. I, I think I always have nights like that. My team would be like, you're too hard on yourself. I'm like, no, I just didn't hit it. I didn't hit it how I need to. Yeah. That's how you keep it sharp, though. 100%. That's how you keep it sharp. 100%. Um, I just feel like listening to your journey at moments like this, when you're out celebrating this big Netflix movie you had, you must have a moment of pause and go, man, I worked for this. <laughs> you know, I came a long way, not just from New York City, but going back to your hometown mm. and working in that Ford plant. Mm. Do you pause and think, man, I've hustled my way pretty far here? Yes, I do. There's no doubt about that. But you know what? I still feel like I've got so much to offer. You know what I mean? I still feel like that guy that's sort of waking up in the van going, today's the day. I really do, you know what I mean? Like, it's not that I'm greedy or anything, it's just that I never really want to lose that sort of inquisitive, what can I do, what can I offer, how can I sharpen, how can I achieve? I never want to lose that. And next up, Luther goes to Hawaii. I can't wait to see it. <laughs> Hawaii, Jamaica, Yeah, just Columbia, somewhere warm with warm, palm bro. trees, right? Yes, 100%. <laughs> Thank 100%. you, man, this Thank is you fun. Very much. Appreciate it. <laughs> I know you look, you're slinging it pretty well. Thank you. Yeah. I like a little bit of a kick, put some tahini on the rim. I know it's early, but whatever. 
Here you go, Willie. Aaron, thank you so much. I'm honored. Cheers. Cheers. A toast to the end of a tour where Marin Morris sold out venues across the country and mixed up her famous margaritas on the bus. Yeah, I'm just not ready for it to be over. I wish we had done more shows. <laughs> Maybe we can add a few at the end. Yeah, we'll book them here and now. For fun, I'll Tag go. I'll on. go busk in the street. <laughs> yeah. I bet you would actually. You've, uh, done, yeah. you've done it before. I'll open the guitar case. The tour shares a name with her latest album called Humble Quest. What does Humble Quest mean to you? I think from 2020 on uh, to now, I've learned a lot about myself because my tour got canceled. I lost my producer, Busby, in late 2019. And so just everything was really humbling. I think just about being a human. It's like you are not in control. You never were. It was strange for all of us, but I have to imagine for someone who's been on the road for, what, 15 years or something like that? doing shows, grinding, hustling the whole time, to just hit the brakes for two years. It was probably disorienting to you in some way. Your husband too, because he's a performer as well. I think the bottom fell out in many ways for me, and I've sort of learned through therapy that I have been doing this hustle since I was 10 or 11 years old. I'm 32, I haven't stopped. It took the world coming to a halt for me to stop. Marin's son Hayes was born in March of 2020 in those first days of the pandemic. I think a lot of identity crises <laughs> happened there, not just like being a new parent and a new mother and dealing with, you know, postpartum depression for the first time and reeling from that and trying to like find the forest through the trees, but also just knowing my worth without someone clapping for me. I kind of felt like this sounds so cheesy, but I, I felt like a woman, like the, the, the sort of form I was supposed to take a long time ago that I've been in arrested development over, it finally came because I had to stop doing this thing that always gave me this um, pride. So how did that manifest itself? What did it mean to you to become a woman, as you say? I think that I'm a child still in a lot of ways that I haven't properly matured uh, because I've always been able to throw it into music. But as far as relationships go, I think from a very early age, I've been taking care of myself and other people and just performing. And um, yeah, I think when you have your own kid and you, you kind of can't go to work, your purpose is very different. And so you kind of have to just like ch chisel it out of stone yourself. And I think I was probably supposed to do that a long time ago, but it just didn't happen until now. Don't know why, don't know why I let you, but I do. Cause I love chasing after you. She spent the time at home reflecting and writing songs with her husband, Ryan Hurd, a fellow singer-songwriter. As far as being creative with him goes, it was like, can we just please write something light to pull me out of this like pandemic doldrum and I don't want to you know sit in the ashes very long here so he kind of just helped me in song form and in just conversation form figure out how to get to the, the light I drove circles around She began to find that light by reaching back to her early days in Nashville, long before she was a Grammy-winning chart-topping star. Circles Around This Town stands out among other great songs. What is the message of that song? What are you saying? Well, the, the line that I love is, I thought when I had hit it, it all looked different, but I've still got the pedal down, driving circles around this town. And that to me was like, I moved to Nashville 10 years ago with nothing. And I really had to build myself up and build my song repertoire just from scratch. And I think I still have that grind in me that is like, your best song is the last one you wrote. So you always are trying to one up yourself. And that's the beautiful competition art form that is Nashville songwriting is like, all your friends are better than you. Mm. And it just, it doesn't make you downtrodden, it makes you excited to show them the last thing you wrote. 
So that community there is really special to me because I feel like they hold me accountable. They also make me a better writer every single time I go back into the room. Yeah, isn't it interesting? I've found this too, where you think in the course of your career, there's going to be some moment where you go, I did it. And you put your feet up. But if you have the motor that people like you and I probably both have, yeah. you never put your feet up, right? Yeah, I mean, Ryan, my husband jokes that uh, he'll be wheeling me off the casino <laughs> stage <laughs> when we're like, I'm 90 or something. That's going to be my fate. It's like, I'll probably just die on stage <laughs> um, because I love it so much. I don't want to take time off. I don't like the idea of saving up a bunch and retiring because it's not a job to me. It's, it's like my passion. <laughs> Coming up on the honky-tonk circuit in her home state of Texas, Morris spent her early years in Nashville writing songs for other people, but it was the one she kept for herself that changed her life. My Church was a coming out party for Morris, and the hits have been coming ever since. I'm a 90s baby in my 80s Mercedes. Including two number one singles. When the bones are good, the rest don't Off of her second album, Girl. Don't you hang your head low. And of course, the relentlessly popular song, The Middle, where she sang lead vocals with Gray and Zed. Did you have any sense when you put that song out that it was going to become this? massive hit number one and change your life in the way that it did? I think it just opened up a huge world audience to my voice. And so if anyone ever heard that like, baby, they'd be like, who is this? Oh, Maren Morris, who's that? And then, you know, they would go to my previous work. So why don't you just meet me in the middle, middle, in the middle, middle? When you sit down to write any new album now, do you think about hits at this point? Or are you just trying to write great songs? I think a hit for me at this point is just a byproduct of hopefully a great song. I can't go in and create with that formula in my head of what I think a hit will be because then you end up following a trend that someone has already set. Um, and I think that you want it to be the opposite of that. You want to set it and create something that's new, or if it is reminiscent or nostalgic of something else, it's done in a way that's really fresh. And um, so yeah, it's at this point, I, I've had crossover success. I've had songs on pop radio, on hot AC, on country. I'll always take it when it comes, but I don't go in and set out to be the hit maker. I just want to write a great song and I want to connect with my friends that I'm writing it with. and connect to a higher self or God or whatever it is in that room, that's what I'm there to do. 
I hesitated to use the term crossover, but since you used it, yeah. what does that mean to you exactly? Because it seems to me that genre doesn't really matter as much anymore. Yeah. If you're good, you're good, and people find it wherever it is. Everything has gone over to streaming, and um, people are just pulling up playlists based on mood, yeah. uh, which I love. That's kind of how I search for things. But respecting and staying true to a root of what made you fall in love with a genre in the first place is important, but um, I, it's not my Bible. Uh, I think that I am so influenced by so many genres and I've never said otherwise. Like from my church on, it's always been the kitchen sink. Success in music has given Morris a voice outside of it too. She has been outspoken on social issues from abortion rights and gun control to the need for diversity in country music and defending trans youth. You use your voice and your platform to speak out on issues. When you started to do that, was there any trepidation of, I'm about to step in it, and now I'm gonna be in the middle of it? Yeah, I think it's gotten more galvanized since I've had my son that I am really trying to make something beyond music, and I want people to look around at my shows and realize, okay, this is really loving and safe and comfortable. Like no matter what walk of life or where you come from, I want you to be able to be safe at my show. And I'm willing to be uncomfortable to do that. Is there a risk to it? Because I would say I'm a fan of country music. Most artists aren't gonna sit down in an interview and talk about the things you talk about or to even go on social media and take on those issues because they say, maybe I believe that, maybe I do feel that way. It's just not worth the fight. It's not worth losing fans. Do you feel any hit from doing that? I mean, Honestly, like when I put my church out, I, I kind of got my first dose of criticism of people saying the song is like blasphemous at my church. And I remember, you know, oh wow, I'm really gonna have to have some thick skin to get through this if this is like the song that's already pissing people off in a very weird way. So I think from the get-go, I've gone through the chapters of um, feeling just the, the criticism and knowing that, you know what, you're gonna piss people off either way, so you better let them know where you stand. And I think that, yeah, I've probably lost listeners along the way, um, but I think the ones I've gained and the ones I've retained, they know exactly who I am and what they're getting, and I see the residual effect of it now that time has passed of the positivity that it's ingrained into the, the fan base. Um, so even if you take a hit here and then, you know, here and there, it's, it's, uh, it's worth it. With the Humble Quest tour now wrapped, it seems Morris has a new itch. I want to do Broadway. You do? Yeah. I've really tried to just scare myself the last few years. I like hosted a late night show, had never done that. Yeah. I flew with the Air Force Thunderbirds in like a fighter jet. <laughs> I'm talking to you, I'm just kidding. Um, That's an adventure. Yeah. Living her life with some spice and a kick. That is delicious, truly. Not just because you made it. Thank you for giving Cheers. me a bar to do it in. <laughs> Cheers again. Cheers. Thank you. On the sidewalks of the West Village, Daniel Radcliffe almost is just another New Yorker. 
I love living here, I love my life here. And yeah, people generally speaking don't really care that it, you're anyone, so that's nice. But then a reminder. We are walking into a big crowd now. That he played one of the most famous and beloved characters in movie history. You're a wizard, Harry. The massive success of the Harry Potter films made Radcliffe the face of a decade-long global phenomenon. In the decades since Harry, the 33-year-old has followed a simple rule. Most of my choices now are mainly informed by, do I think I'll have fun doing this? I love it. His latest film, Weird, the Al Yankovic story, certainly qualifies. And what did you think? How do you describe what this movie is? It's not a biopic, per se. It is the only thing that Master of Song Parodies, Weird Al, it is the only thing that his movie biopic could be, which is a parody of movie biopics. There are some events that are the kernel of truth. The first third of the film doing a kind of uh, a slightly plausible shaped biopic and then at a certain point um, we just go into a fully alternate universe uh, through the world of Weird Al. So for example Al really did start playing the accordion because he was approached by a door-to-door -door accordion salesman. Uh, he really did record My Bologna in a bathroom originally. My, 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 yeah, yeah. But yeah, Madonna and Al obviously get together and have a torrid love affair that everybody knows that they had. I was wondering if you were going to do a parody of my song, Like a Virgin. I'm curious, is that song autobiographical? Famous for his lyrical lampooning of everyone from Michael Jackson eat it, eat it. to Lady Gaga. Yankovic wrote Weird and hand-picked the actor who plays him. You don't look much like him, which is true as you sit here now, but when you turn up on screen, you yeah. look like Weird Al. You know, makeup and hair does an amazing job, as does costume, and I did grow my own mustache. If I could give a, a piece of advice to any young actor, it would be, if you can, grow your own facial hair. Fake facial hair is deeply irritating. Good tip, good yeah, tip. Yeah, there you go. Very <laughs> applicable to everyone. <laughs> exactly. Um, <laughs> Let's talk about the music side of it. It's Al's voice, yes. right? Yeah. You're performing along. Mm -hmm. Was that fun to sing all these famous songs? It like, was great. It was that. Yeah, all of, the, all of the musical performances were really. They were, it was part of the reason I loved doing the film was just that every day there was so much to do and it was all different. So I, I tried to learn the accordion. It's really hard. I did not become very good, um, but I did enough so that like my my goal was that on a 18 day shoot. I, would, uh, I wouldn't be limiting our director too much. He wouldn't have to shoot around me or shoot my hands just out of frame. I think he did okay. You mentioned very casually that this was an 18-day film. Yes. For people who don't understand how movies are made, Yes. in relationship to other work maybe you've well, done, okay. what is that like? The average Harry Potter film was 11 months. Now, that is also extreme. Um, Lost City, which is like a fairly big film, was three or four months. And then this, like 18-day shoot with six musical numbers and two action sequences and a bunch of other stuff and a bunch of actors and all period uh, hair and makeup and costume. In every conversation I had with our director beforehand, I was like, this isn't possible, is it? And I would never have had the confidence we would be able to do it had he not seemed so assured. Is there something nice about, it's obviously totally different than what you've done in so many other movies, but about, we've just got to go. We think we've got it, let's go on to the next it's scene. It's my favorite, actually. Is it really? It's, yeah, because you, don't, you have less time to become reflective, and actually I think being reflective isn't always a good thing for an actor. Yeah. And I think there's also just something about the feeling of satisfaction you get from doing eight pages in a day as opposed to an eighth of a page a day is, is it's much greater. So as you sit here with this film now in the bank, you're getting ready for your next project. You're rehearsing right now. Yeah. You've come uh, for rehearsals for Merrily We Roll Along. Yes. Great to be back on the stage. Yeah, I'm, I'm really excited. That I, I, I hate um, and I'm sorry to anyone who has to listen to this. It's very pretentious sounding. I hate when actors talk like this, but it is a gift to get this kind of material and to be able to work on material that is, you know, I'm very lucky in my whole career. I, I get to work on amazing stuff, but Sondheim is truly, um, you know, another level. Forgive the cliched question, but what do you get from stage acting that you don't get from being in a film? What do you love about that? Forgive the overly simplistic answer, but like the adrenaline rush. I grew up on film sets and so they are, place of incredible like comfort and like, I love them but 
in terms of like a raw kind of rush of adrenaline, that that doesn't do that. Um, theater does, and there is something just thrilling and bonding, especially with the other actors on stage, about knowing that you're out there and you're with each other and that you have to sort of have each other's backs and look out for each other um, is really an exciting feeling. And yeah, just getting to produce a story in front of a live audience every night is incredibly exciting because something could go wrong. Mm -hmm. You know, there's, there's a safety net with film um, that there isn't with stage. And that's one of the things that I think makes it like intoxicating to do. Slightly terrifying. Yeah, like it, you could screw it up and you have to remember not to. <laughs> Radcliffe grew up in London, the only child of a literary agent and a casting director. I definitely wanted to be an actor for the first time when I was like five or six. I saw a production of a pantomime, um, which is basically like fairy tales done on stage every Christmas. I went to see a production that my mum had cast and I was just like, oh, I want to do that. And both my mum and my dad had had pretty negative experiences as actors. So they, it was kind of immediately like, oh no, you don't, you don't want to do that. He booked his first role at nine years old in the BBC miniseries, David Copperfield. Let's always be friends, Emily. Harry Potter director, Chris Columbus, spotted the promising actor there and asked him to audition for the role of a young wizard. Wow. Radcliffe got the part and stepped into a universe that would change his life. Expecto Patrona! Working on set suddenly, I was very, very sure immediately of like, oh, I love this. I love being on set. But my mum and dad were always very good at sort of keeping your options open and going like, you could do anything on a set or you don't have to do acting. But as I became older and uh, on Potter, it was very clear that I was like, I, this is the thing I know how to do right now. And I, I have a lot a long way to go and a lot to get better at it. But that was my best route to staying on sets and staying in this world that I loved. So it was really, I suppose it was around the, the fourth, uh, third or fourth film that I was completely, you know, knew I wanted to do whatever I had to, to stay in the film industry for the rest of my life. Did you ever have any doubts yourself as you moved along? <sighs> no, not really. I, there was, there was a moment when my contract after the third film wasn't, you know, 
like we needed to renew it. Um, and I mean, maybe I thought about it for half a second, but not re not in any significant way. Like I love so many of my friends were there. Like I loved. It would have meant leaving so many things that I loved that it just seemed crazy. You were called the most famous 12 year old in the world when the Harry Potter films took off. Did you have any sense at that age of what was happening around you? I mean, I knew that that was happening, but the difference between sort of understanding the words people say when they say this is a global phenomenon and actually feeling that is huge, particularly as a kid, um, which I think in a way is great. Like you wouldn't want a kid to feel the the sort of the weight and the you know the, the sense of expectation of, of all of that. Also, I think we were actually amazingly sheltered from how the world was receiving the films and how big they were getting by making the films. I'd become so much more aware of the Potter fandom and things since finishing the films and sort of the 10 years since than mm -hmm. I was when we were actually on it. My mum and dad did an amazing job at you take so much of your reaction from your parents when you're that age. We were flying into Tokyo when I was, I think, 12 or 13. It was after the second film. Somebody got a message to us saying, like, they have 100 security in arrivals. And we were all like, that's ridiculous. Like, what's that for? And then we got there and it was like, oh, this might not be enough. <laughs> um, it was one of the craziest, like, crushes I've ever been through. And then we got into the car and um, my mom and dad were just like in hysterics and were just like laughing mm. at what like a crazy, funny, weird thing that had been. And I think had they reacted shocked or startled or freaked out, then I probably would have been as well. You yeah. seem like a normal guy sitting across from me here. You live a pretty private life. Yeah. How would you say you've done it? It really helps that the thing I always knew that I loved about all of this was the work and being on set. I think if the sort of the life and the trappings of what you think an actor's life is, is what you want, then You'll be in and also if fame is in any way the thing that motivates you, then you will be in trouble because mm. fame will go. Like at some point, at some point I'm not going to be famous like I am now. And if fame's a big part of your identity in that way, then you're really screwed when that goes. So yeah, I had a bunch of really good people around me. My parents, my dresser on set was a guy called Will who was sort of like an older brother figure, but also would have absolutely, you know, if I was ever getting cocky or anything like that, like I was gonna hear about it from him. Mm. So I think going through all that has given me a love of whatever privacy I can have. Post Potter, Radcliffe has had the freedom to play everything from a corpse in Swiss Army Man. Now I both can see as well. Maybe you look mysterious and girls like mysterious. To God's assistant on the TBS show, Miracle Workers. Is that God? So I decided to blow up first. He has performed on stages from the West End to Broadway. And do you play it nicely? But Radcliffe is content knowing to many people he always will be Harry. I learned so much from those films. By the time I had finished Potter, I had done more hours on a set than some people will get to do in their lives. Yes. Fortunately, like some of the results is, is up there and it's not all great. I 100% see that, but there's definitely, I, I watch some now and I go like, okay, I can see myself starting to get better. So what is your philosophy? Here you are doing a Weird Al Yankovic parody biopic, then rolling into Sondheim right after that. <laughs> yeah. How do you look at the world now professionally? Th that, that, this year has been amazing. <laughs> uh, so like I got to film Weird earlier this year and then Lost City came out and then um, I got to film Miracle Workers um, and then Weird's coming out and now I'm starting on Merrily. So I'm really getting to run the gamut of doing different things that I love. I, I'm re I sort of, I'm just acting on the assumption that at some point this will end and I'll have to take some jobs that I'm not as excited about. But yeah, right now it's just, uh, it's, I, I couldn't really wish for anything more.
Last time I interviewed you, we were on Zoom and yeah. I was literally in my garage. And I was home. This is so much fancier. I actually like connecting with people. I like being a part of the world. Kate Hudson is stepping back into the world in style. Look at this pool. I think I'll go for a swim. Maybe I'll lay out for a bit. Being back doing comedy, this is where I'm happiest. In Glass Onion, the follow-up to the hit 2019 whodunit Knives Out, written and directed again by Ryan Johnson, Hudson plays a hilariously self-absorbed former model named Birdie J. So obviously you're a fan of the first movie. I think most of us were. So when the phone rings or the email comes in that says, hey, Kate, they're interested in you for the next one, yeah. your reaction is? Oh, f I hope I get this part. I mean, <laughs> I hope it's me. Usually there's the short list, you know, of like people write for parts, you hear about it. I was on that short list. Um, he wanted to meet with me. And I remember reading it for the first time, Birdie J. And I was like, oh man, come on, put me in coach. Like this is right up my alley. And, and again, going back to his writing, I read so much comedy. And like, it's always, somehow comedy is like, they, you, they read a lot like sketches. You know, they're like situational comedy. Like, the device is funny. The situation is funny. But when, when you get a writer who knows how to write a character that earns the laugh, mm. it's, like, it's like a dream for, I think, anybody who loves to, to, to play comedic roles. And so I just kind of, you know, chanted a little bit, prayed to God, <laughs> and went in and tried to charm the pants off of Ryan. And it worked. Clearly it, it worked. worked. <laughs> Hello. We can't hug, right? I no. mean, can we? There's something very familiar about Birdie J. She's not a person, yeah, but she's sort of a archetype of a, a kind of person. She's a thing. She chooses to show up in a room to be seen. She chooses to open her mouth when she probably shouldn't <laughs> say things to be seen. You're so cute. You really try. I like that. You really make an effort. Well, I figured, Grease. The cast, just, oh my gosh. You go around that dining room table and you're just so excited that yeah. each of you is at the table. Catherine uh, Hahn. Are we even gonna talk about the elephant in the room? Am I the elephant? Yeah, you're the elephant. You're not that bad. And Catherine and I to be reunited <laughs> like that was honestly like one of the great joys of this experience for me because she, she and I on How to Lose a Guy in 10 days just fell in love with each I mean, We just loved each other so much. And, <laughs> oh, Good morning, sunshine. <laughs> to see her career and how far she's come and how much, like, wisdom she now brings to her work, you know, from where we both started. It was 22. 20 years ago. Yeah. Oh, my God. Does that feel I like... would say that goes fast, but it feels like five lifetimes <laughs> ago. Like, why does this always happen to me? So to come back here... Did you have the same old relationship yes. and the jokes and it yes. was all Yes, which is the there. best feeling yeah. because you don't want people to change. You want them to grow, not, but not like change the essence of who they are. And I, I think we're both like that. Like we haven't really changed much. We've just grown.
Hudson's professional growth spurt started at 21 years old with a breakout performance in the 2000 classic Almost Famous. You're too sweet for rock and roll. Sweet? The movie made Hudson famous and earned her nominations for both a Golden Globe and an Academy Award. What do you think? About the food or you? Both. Over the next decade, Hudson became one of Hollywood's most successful stars, with box office hits like the aforementioned How to Lose a Guy in 10 Days, opposite Matthew McConaughey. You call my bluff? You bet I am. Then there was You, Me, and Dupree. Dupree? Live with us? And Fool's Gold, pairing her again with McConaughey. You know, PlayStation. <laughs> when she's not acting, the 43-year-old Hudson stays in motion with her successful activewear company, among others. So today we're in the design studio. You're running Fabletics. Nice. You've got vodka. I've got vodka. You've got In Bloom. Mm -hmm. I've got three companies. I do a lot, but I get so bored. Like, there's no way I could just sit and wait like six months to make another movie. I have to be doing something. Right. And I'm also quite linear. Like I, I, I go back and forth. Like I have my weird creative artistic times where I like have to like throw everybody out and I gotta get weird and you know. And then I have moments where I'm like, I just wanna like be administrative and like organize files. <laughs> <laughs> I wanna like get my linear brain going and and that I think is where the business side came in. Like I, I st started with just wanting to be, wanting to, before it was like, everyone was like growing some kind of company. I wanted to be in fashion. I saw this idea, everyone was like, it's a little risky. It's, you know, not like an a normal endorsement. It's, you know, it was like I'm investing in a company for leggings that's, you know, affordable clothing for, for women. And I was like, this is awesome. I get to talk about something I'm passionate about. I get to learn about this business. I had no idea that the success of the company would be what it was. And then, then, then the learning curve came. And then I got really in. I like, I like the business aspect of it. It's not easy. It's hard and it's a grind. But it's, um, there's something about it. I, I like the grind. Like, I like the winning part of growing a company that means something to you, that has, like, purpose. I, I enjoy that. It sounds like the answer to this question is no, but is there any world where you <laughs> just run your businesses and you say, no, the acting part of my life no, is no, over? No, never, never. It'll be the opposite for me. For me, it'll be, like, I think that part, I think it's, I think that as I get older, I want to just read more. I want to write more. I want to sing. You mentioned that a few times yeah. in public. This is well, happening. Now it's Here just we happening. go. It's just happening. So now. what do we? Yeah. We've got an album coming. I or what's... do. I have an album. I've been making an album. That's what came for for COVID for me. That sort of out of that was like, okay, I'm making a record. And actually, it, 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 the way it happened was, I was. It started with me just saying, you know what? I I need to sing more. I was so terrified of singing in front of people. And I was over it. I was. I don't like being fearful. And I. And so I was like, okay, if someone asks me to sing, I'm just going to say yes. I'm just going to say. So I got into the parent band <laughs> at my school. But the parent band, they asked me, they're like, will you come sing a song with the parent band? I was like, oh, I said I'd say yes. So, yeah. But the parent band is like, a, like all Grammy award winning, like musicians and producers. And, but, but they really like, they were like, Kate, you, you need to make a record. Like you, then... Linda Perry, she's a songwriter. She did What's Going On, she, oh, Four wow. Non Blondes. But she's very, yeah. very, very prolific, like kind of a hit maker, right? Like writes the most amazing songs. And she cold called me and was like, why aren't you making a record? And I said, because I don't know. I don't have the structure. I don't have the time. I don't have the... And she goes, no. And she said, come into my studio. And I sat in her studio. She made me sing a song that she had written. And then she sat me down. She's like, we're making a record. You got to do it. Put your fall aside. We're, we're going to write. And she goes, you write music? I go, yeah. She's like, all right, we're going to write together. So we wrote. And me, Danny, and Linda sat for two months and wrote 25 songs. Wow. And 
And then so it's been just from then, it's just like kind of no expectation, just like a love for songwriting. It was all the emotion needed to just pour out. It did. It's there. You'll hear it. I also think like I, for my kids, they know I sing every day. I write music. Even for them to see that at this time in my life, I don't give it, I don't care. I'm just gonna, I just have to do it. And I hope it's as, as warmly received as I have cared for it, you know, because it's just a labor of love. I mean, that's all it is. And if it means that then I have this pivot and I'm playing shows and I'm doing things like that, I would, I would love it. But I have no expectation for, like there's no calculated move. I just wanna put music in the world. People love you, you have goodwill. I, <laughs> They're gonna root for you. <laughs> well, I'm gonna good. root for this you. This is good, okay, yeah, we'll great. Yeah, st we'll start great. there. You'll like yeah. one song, at least. Staying busy helps the mother of three to cope with her son Ryder's recent move across the country to college. But she has found a support group with friends Gwyneth Paltrow and Reese Witherspoon. My girlfriend Gwyneth, our kids were in school together. We both had that moment together when we like look at each other, we're like, how you doing? Because <laughs> we experienced it at the same time. And Anne Reese, all three of us ladies, all of our kids went to college at the same time. It's so hard. I mean, he's in the city, so it's great because when I'm here, I get to see him and we hang out and he's loving the city. I mean, and the first two weeks of school, he wrote me, he's like, mom, you lost me for four years. Like, oh, I'm here. Good. I'm in it. I love it here. And I was like, oh, all you want is your kid to thrive and like be happy and feel good in his skin. And he's such a great person. I'm so, and he's always, Ryder's always been that way. Ryder's the best. He's good, good human. He's super talented. He's really smart. He's very, like, perfectly self deprecating. He's got that great sense of humor that will get him through life. But man, when I'm in LA and I go to the coffee machine in the morning and I don't hear his voice, it's a big one. I didn't think it would hit me so hard. You raised a great kid who can go all the way across the country and thrive on his own. That's right. You did and, it. And that's, I hope, yeah. I, I, I feel that in him. And I, I think the other thing too is like someone said to me, because I was having a moment he was talking about, I don't know, you know, the, the second he was 18, he like got a tattoo and then he was talking about motorcycles and things. And I was like, oh my God. <gasps> and this woman said, faith, not fear. Mm. Faith, not fear. And that's become my mantra. Like, cause I am such a high anxiety mother. I have this like floating mother anxiety through life. Like, where's, where's Bing? Where's Ronnie? What's going, you know, like I, I, I'm like, you know, want all my baby cubs, yes. like, faith, not fear. Mm, That's that. my new motto. I love that. <laughs> I'm glad he's doing so well. He's doing great. He's going to be a part of this weird world that I'm in for sure. Over a career spanning 35 years, Matt Damon has played a soldier at war. Why? Why, why do I deserve to go? A thief on the Vegas Strip. It's a smash and grab job, huh? And an astronaut stuck on Mars. I'm still alive. Surprise. 
Now he finds himself at the center of a pivotal moment in history. How about because this is the most important thing that ever happened in the history of the world? In Oppenheimer, Damon is Leslie Groves Jr., a real-life general in the United States Army, tasked with supervising scientist J. Robert Oppenheimer on the Manhattan Project, the secret operation to create the world's first atomic bomb, eventually used twice in Japan during World War II. Why don't you have a Nobel Prize? Why aren't you a general? They're making me one for this. Perhaps I'll have the same luck. A Nobel Prize for making a bomb? Had you heard of the general? Did you know anything about him? No, I, I didn't know. I wasn't familiar with all the details and, and, and how kind of fraught this whole situation was with, you know, because of the, the, the differing philosophies, right? The military's, you know, very necessary need to compartmentalize and, you know, everything's on a need to know basis. And, versus the scientists who share all their information because they're all about trying to get to the greater truth. And so they want to build on each other's work. And so that is, that is you know, obviously a kind of a natural source of tension for, you know, the military and the scientists coming together. That, and, and everybody was needed. I mean, the scale of this operation is just insane, uh, what they were able to do, the logistics of it. And that was really what Groves was good at. But but I think it, it was like herding cats for him most of the time with the scientists because they just did not align philosophically. In a star-studded cast that includes Emily Blunt and Robert Trinity Downey Jr., Jr., Irish actor Killian Murphy plays Oppenheimer, a genius haunted by his creation. The chances are near zero. Near zero. What do you want from theory alone? Zero would be nice. You guys get into in the in the film. I wonder if you thought about it or talked with the other cast members about just this moral dilemma that's been debated for eighty years right. about using an atomic bomb, which is the one side says we saved lives by using it. This would have been right. a years long war, a land invasion of Tokyo, et cetera, right. et cetera, et cetera. Right. The other side is it's it's a war crime. Right. And that's kind of at the heart of the, the tension for Oppenheimer anyway. Yeah, and, 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 and his cross to bear for the rest of his life, you know, that he brought this into existence. And um, it's such a big idea that, you know, we were both born into a world that had nuclear weapons. You know what I mean? It, it's never, we've never not lived in that world. You know, and it obviously raises a lot of questions about technologies we're continuing to develop, right? And, and what are our responsibilities to each other and to humanity and, and, you know, when you start dealing with some of these existential technologies, where's the line? To create the film's stunning explosions, director Christopher Nolan did things the old-fashioned way. Action! Chris didn't use special effects for a lot of the stuff or any of the stuff you right. see. It's kind of like old-school filmmaking where there's no CGI to it. Right. But That's he pulls it off. Yeah, it's part of his, he's got an engineer's brain on top of being, it's, he's like this incredible mix of like left brain, right brain. He figures out a way to do it and a way to do it in camera. Um, and it's always better for the performances and it's always better for us if, you know, if it's all really happening and it's not, look at the tennis ball, you know. Right. <laughs> oh, it's a big explosion, ah, you know what I mean? That's always a little soul destroying. But you know, with Chris, it's like, he's gonna blow it up, <laughs> you know? <laughs> And when he does that in IMAX, it blows you through the back of the field. It blows you out the door. Like yeah, almost yeah, yeah. <laughs> back into your chair, for yeah. sure. Oppenheimer comes in the same year for Damon as the hit movie Air, directed by Ben Affleck. Got a name for it? Air Jordan. What was it like to be directed by your best friend? <laughs> it was great. It was great. It's like being directed by Chris. It's, uh, you know, great directors really give you the freedom. It's, it's a collaboration, it's a partnership. So we're definitely have an eye towards finding good stuff to do together. That's so cool to, to yeah. go back to your earliest days together. Yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah. Just be buddies and, and when you were trying to scrambling to get work. And, yeah. You know, that's, and I imagine you have a shorthand on set too where oh, it yeah. makes life well, easy. What's really great is there's no diplomacy. You know what I mean? And <laughs> yeah. like you can waste so much time by trying to be polite and you, yeah. you know, in the movie business and, and in theater, they've you know, developed a whole vocabulary for how to talk to somebody and basically how to tell somebody they're sucking, <laughs> right? And like, we can just say you <laughs> suck. <laughs> so it's not, that was great, but what if we tried this? It's what like, if, I'm wondering yeah. if uh, he feels a little more reserved <laughs> in this, 
Just tell me I'm overacting. <laughs> you know what I mean? Where Ben and I grew up, you know, we'd take the subway places and- Damon and Affleck famously grew up two years and two blocks apart in Cambridge, Massachusetts, bonding over their love of writing and acting. It seems to me, just reading everything I could read about you, that you knew like really early on that this was it. Probably by the time I was 13, yeah. yeah. And like was very, taking it very seriously. And we had the best teacher, I think, in the world who, who came into our lives at that point. And he taught us how to write. He taught us how to write through improvisation because we would generate a lot of our own plays, exactly how Ben and I write now and be these two kids who live a block and a half away from each other, like totally obsessed with, with acting and movies and, and you know, we never doubted that this is what we were going to do. Damon was 18 when he delivered a single line in his Let's first movie, Mystic Damon, Pizza. Mom, do you want my green stuff? Before acclaimed roles in films like Big School greens. Ties and Courage Under Fire. The captain was, was hurt pretty bad. Goodwill Hunting, the movie that changed his life, began as a writing assignment while Damon was studying at Harvard. You don't know it to yourself. You owe it to me. I started in a playwriting class, but I handed it to Ben. And I was like, I, what do you think of this? He goes, I don't know what happens next, but we should do this together. And I went, great. I don't know what happens next either. And so we, we literally kind of didn't force it. And then one night we were sitting around and he just goes, because we had the scene where I show up in Robin Williams' office and kind of the first time I meet him and he ends up holding me against the, yeah. that's the five pages that survived. And we were sitting there, we hadn't talked about the script in months, and Ben just goes out of the blue. He goes, you know, I don't think he'd tolerate like being talked to that way. I think he'd probably say something back and he'd probably say something like, and he started to talk, and, and, and then we started going, and I went, oh my God, that's right. Okay, so, so we wrote that monologue that Robin does at the park bench. That was the second mm -hmm. thing we wrote. You don't know about real loss, because it only occurs when you love something more than you love yourself. Scenes like that one earned Damon and Affleck an Academy Award for Best Screenplay. I just said to Matt, losing would suck and winning would be really scary, and it's really, really scary. As Goodwill Hunting and the endless list of hits that followed have made Damon one of the biggest stars in the world, he has managed off screen to live relatively quietly with wife Luciana and their four daughters, spending time on his nonprofit, Water.org which provides clean drinking water and sanitation. I feel like if I'm good at anything, it's like picking partners, because like between Ben and my wife and Gary White, who <laughs> we co-founded water.org together, like those are the three most significant partnerships in my life. And, and all those things are going really well. In so. which order, Matt? In which order are they most significant? Well, listen, <laughs> you're supposed to divide your day up, right, into thirds, so uh, so, I, so there's no particular order. But obviously my wife. There you I'm, go, if you're gonna, that's why I was helping you uh, out there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was a layup. <laughs> Thank you so much to the city of Boston and, and, and 
and God, I know we're forgetting somebody. Whoever we forgot, we love you and we, we love you. you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Standing on that stage at the Oscars, did you feel kind of victory for like scrappy young screenwriters, actors? Yeah. And and to be fair, like we weren't the first people to do that. And like we had the example of Sylvester Stallone, but Stallone was like our kind of code word basically because it was like we read this story about him having like a few hundred bucks and he uh turned down like 35 grand or something they because they were just trying to get him off the movie mm -hmm. like look you wrote it just go away go away and he just wouldn't do it he wouldn't and so we'd go into these meetings and these people would say well you guys can't play the parts i mean come on they, you know they wanted brad and leo you know right. it's like you guys can't play the parts and we were like Sylvester Stallone. <laughs> yes, we can. We can play the part. We are playing the part. With the perseverance of Rocky, the pair eventually got their movie made, but not without a big assist from famed director Francis Ford Coppola. We had A-list filmmakers pass on it because they wanted Brad and Leo and didn't want to risk it with us. And, and then I got The Rainmaker, and it was, I remember Francis said to me one day, oh, I got a call from Robin. I said, what? And he goes, Robin Williams called me. He was asking about you. And so we read the script and he loved it. But he goes, who the hell are these guys? And Francis said, he's a, he's a great young actor. You should work with him. So and that, that was like, wow. yeah. So Francis vouched for me and, and Robin took the part. What was it like the next day after the Oscars? Was it literally an overnight thing walking outside and people go, you're Matt Damon in a way we, they'd We had a before. really funny thing happen actually, because we were shooting Dogma. We were in Pittsburgh. So Ben and I had to fly the night after the Oscars, we had to fly a red eye to Pittsburgh from LA. And so we land at like, I don't know, seven or eight in the morning. And we come off the plane and there are like 30 people in the jetway at the gate waiting for us, cheering. And there was this kind of momentary hysteria. We're like, oh, can I have a picture? Yeah. And we, but Ben and I just sat and talked to everybody, you know, for 15 minutes or so. And then the way the Pittsburgh airport is, you, there's, a sh there's a tram that you have to take. So we go and get on the tram. And by the time we're on the tram, we're on the tram with these 30 people. They've all completely lost interest in us. <laughs> and we're holding the thing and we're sitting there and Ben goes, can you believe this? <laughs> he goes, <laughs> he goes, that was it. Oh, we got 15 minutes. <laughs> Damon and Affleck have stretched those 15 minutes into 25 years, and now they're out to change the movie business. Air was the first film from their production company, Artists' Equity, which aims to spread the wealth around the set. Well, the idea was that there's bloat on movie sets, but people don't really know where it is. They don't understand where it is, and we know where it is. And so we let every department run itself and in the money that's saved, we, we share it and distribute it throughout the crew. So they're getting much more money and they have autonomy and creative autonomy. And so the production's run incredibly efficiently and, it, and it's just really worked. It was, um, it's been great. It's been really, really fun. We are exposing based on what, 30 some years of experience, yeah. like flaws you see in the system. Right. And getting people the money they deserve. It's disruptive. People are talking about it as a model, like a new model. For I hope movies, so. You know? I mean, it would yeah. be nice if people got paid better. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Thank you, man. So oh, good sorry. to talk Thank to you. you. I appreciate it.
is famous for draining shots from long distance, but not usually this long. What's your target, Steph? I'm going to hit it at the... Uh, Far? It's going to be a little fade that's going to land on it. Clearly, you're playing a lot based on what I saw in Tahoe. I, I want to thank the Los Angeles Lakers for <laughs> their contributions to me winning my golf tournaments this summer because I got a four-week head start on golf training camp. In his day job with the Golden State Warriors, Curry has won four championships and a pair of league MVP awards. Considered by most to be the greatest shooter in NBA history, Curry has revolutionized the game while calmly launching shots from previously preposterous spots on the floor. Do you have an appreciation for the fact that 14-year-old boys take two dribbles inside half court and jack up threes because of you, <laughs> that you have truly changed the way basketball is played? Yeah, it's hard to have, like really reflect on it, but I understand even just at the highest level of professional basketball in the league, you know, how teams have shifted their strategies around, how guys have added that as a, a skill set of theirs, the way that they see the game. It was never in, like an intention of like, that's what I'm here to do, but it's just how I see the game and the irrational confidence that I have to shoot all those type of shots. <laughs> the one thing for the young next generation is like, I want them to have the vision of being able to shoot the same shots. I want them to have the confidence that, you know, they can play the game that way, but uh, just gotta put the work in and have the patience that it'll, it'll you can keep stacking blocks to get to that level. Stephen, good job, good job. Curry grew up a small, skinny kid in the shadow of his dad, Del Curry, another smooth shooter who played most of his NBA career with the Charlotte Hornets. I'm constantly trying to find the space just to be able to survey my life. Steph's story is the subject of the new Apple TV Plus documentary, Stephen Curry, Underrated. There's a shot in there of you I don't know, are you 10 years uh, old or something like nine time, years old, yeah. sitting at the end of the bench, the very end of the bench, biting your fingernails, and it freezes on you, and I'm like, that kid's gonna be Steph Curry? <laughs> Growing up in Charlotte, where my dad played for 10 years for the Charlotte Hornets, you would think that, you know, what came with that was like an easy path towards, you know, just being the best player on every, on every team that you are. And I had the exact opposite experience. So kind of a weird kind of contrast to what expectations could have been, but what, you know, naysayers and critics, even at that time, um, were saying about, you know, I, I just wasn't ready for that level. And it developed an identity around, you know, work ethic and, and your inner confidence in yourself that when you're out there, you know, take advantage of every opportunity, you know, don't be afraid of failure. There's a perseverance and patience that comes with it as well, that it's not just a basketball story, it's not just a sports story. It's something uh, that I encourage anybody to find, what makes you different, what makes you unique, what you have to offer the world at whatever level, um, and own it and, and pour everything you have into it. So that underrated mindset is always a part of my DNA, no matter mm -hmm. what's, what's happened um, you know, in my NBA career and my life, I still carry that you know, with me. When Curry wasn't recruited by any of the colleges where he dreamed of playing, he accepted an offer from coach Bob McKillop at Davidson College, not far from home. You credit coach McKillop, who believed in you and gave you a chance, even though you struggled in that first game as a freshman. How much credit does he deserve for the man sitting here today? A lot, um, just in terms of from the time he started recruiting me, uh, the message was, you know, that I was I was good enough, like I didn't have to change. Uh, he was gonna, you know, try to unlock my full potential. He's gonna push me, it wasn't gonna be easy, but, um, you know, I truly believe that he had my best interest in, in knowing that I could add a lot of value to the Davidson program. He had uh, some probably doubts creep in the, my first college game where I had 13 turnovers. And the footage of that game was worse than I actually remember. <laughs> I it was, uh, if I'm a coach and I'm watching that <laughs> performance, uh, I'm making a quick substitution and, and moving on. But Coach McKillop, he stuck with me and he instilled confidence in me through those failures. And it wasn't just me as the basketball player, it was me as the man as well. And he, he coached and, and mentored both. And so I feel like um, that decision to go there, play for him, and those three years that I had there were 
you know, the most formative years uh, of my basketball career. Curry became a national star while leading Davidson on a magical run through the 2008 NCAA tournament, falling just two points shy of an improbable Final Four. Curry turned pro after his junior year. When did you feel like you had arrived in the NBA, that you, had to, that you weren't proving yourself anymore? It was probably my fourth year. Uh, we had a game in, in New York at the Garden, and it was, I scored 54 points, but we lost that night. And it was the first time, really, that my confidence is an unbelievable unlock in, in, in anything, especially on the basketball court. And people started to talk about you a little different once I had... Uh, had that night and I think it just gave me a boost. I already knew that I was, you know, capable, but I think that the tone trying to, you know, started to change a little bit and then from there there's a little failure on the back end of that. That next year we had lost in the playoffs um, against the Clippers in seven game series and we were still tapping on the door trying to get to the next to the uh, to the mountaintop of, of being a championship contender but that game specifically just kind of changed the narrative okay we got to take this kid seriously uh, because he's got game and he's fearless and um, I appreciate that little stamp of validation uh, but I knew that there was a little bit more work that needed to be done it's funny what a big night at the garden can do isn't yeah, it absolutely the whole world notices absolutely I heard you say and I was surprised to hear it that you still feel a little underrated how can that be when people talk about you as maybe the greatest player who ever lived? Certainly right now, you and LeBron, how could you still be underrated? It's, it's a tough one to explain because of what the resume looks like, but for me, it's like the healthy insecurity of the way that I've seen my, you know, the game of basketball and life from day one uh, has not changed at all. I still want to enjoy every opportunity that I have. There's a lot of gratitude and appreciation for you know, what I've been able to accomplish, but I still have that I have to prove to myself that I can still do it and I can still do it and I can still do it for as long as I can. And, you know, that's what drives me. And maybe it's something that I can, you know, trick yourself into every year knowing like, all right, you have success, but it's, it's what have you, you know, what have you done lately type of mentality that you have to kind of keep living up to. And if I don't have that underrated DNA come out and that drive me in terms of how I prepare for the next season or how I prepare for, you know, a big a big game throughout the regular season or a big playoff run. Um, I won't be myself. And so, yeah, that's the best way to explain it. And mm -hmm. knowing that that underrated mindset is, again, a part of, you know, just who I am and it oozes out of me at, at every, at every, um, every opportunity. I imagine part of it too is people keep writing off, your, not just you, but your team. I'm watching the film and remembering every time you would lose a playoff series. The dynasty's over. That's it. It's over. They're too old. Break up the band. Let's move on. And then you'd win another championship. Why do you think people keep doing that, making the same mistake of counting you guys out? I don't know, man. I know, you know, once you're successful um, and you you got the target on your back at, at a certain point, people want to see, you know, see you lose almost in a sense. I feel like that's kind of the nature, unless you're in Dub Nation or out in the Bay Area and you're a true Warriors fan. So. Um, it's just a part of the nature of, you know, of, of, of winning. And, you know, once you show a little sign of, of vulnerability or like you're, you, you lost your powers, I think that's what, you know, we've thrived on. Um, and we're in that position right now, trying to reestablish who we are at the top of the league. And especially our core being still together, it's an amazing opportunity to tap into that, you know, for, for one more run uh, to see if we can get back there. <laughs>
In recent years, Curry has extended his range to include the film production company Unanimous Media, the underrated golf and basketball tours for disadvantaged kids, and the Eat, Learn, Play Foundation he created with his wife Aisha. Do you have moments, Steph, now where you go, I can't believe the skinny kid biting his nails on the end of the bench got to where he got? All the time. Do you? All the time. I think that's a part of just being able to stay in the moment and like really enjoy you know what's right in front of you. Um, we've, we've tried to maintain that as much as possible because I just have so much fun playing this game. I think if we lose that sense of gratitude or you know that wonder of what's happened, um, that would kind of rob you of the joy as well because mm. it's, just, it's truly special. You play with a smile on your face and you're running around like crazy and you're hiding behind screens and sneaking out and turning around when you shoot a three. Does that just come naturally to you, that joy that you wear? Because it's fun to watch as a fan and it's a good example for kids playing the game. Yeah, it, it's, it came natural early. I vowed and been very intentional about um, bringing joy to every environment that I go into because I feel like, you know, that's what helps me kind of again tap into the moment, uh, not be afraid of, of you know, whatever expectations might be now or, you know, again, that fear of failure of, you know, uh, if I'm having fun, that means I'm going to work. It means I'm going to enjoy coming to practice. That means I'm going to enjoy, you know, the sacrifices that it takes to be successful at this level. Um, and that's my happy place out there. Oh, step away from the ball just a little bit. Yeah. And then more, more, yeah. it almost feels, it might feel like you're squatting, yeah. but that right there. Yeah. Golf tips with Steph Curry. Okay. That first year in retirement, that's what I'm gonna be. I'm gonna be like an amateur swing coach. Yeah. You'll find me on like any range. I'm just walking down the aisle, like, all right. So you've got a couple years left on your contract. You're 35 right yes, now. Sir. Um, LeBron's 38, he'll be pushing 40 here pretty soon. Brady played till he was 45. Do you see the end anytime soon? I mean, you're playing at a very high level, but do you start thinking that way at this point? As you, you do start thinking about it. It almost puts into perspective how important these next, you know, two, three years are in terms of, you know, doubling down on the level that I want to be at and continue to play at um, and, and pushing it you know, to the limit as, as long as I can. You can learn lessons from, you know, guys like that, that it is possible. Obviously, you have to be mindful of, of how you approach, you know, your off seasons and, you know, uh, the work that you put in on your body to make sure you can stay at that level. And I'm doing all those things to, to give myself a chance to be successful. But uh, I, I just love the fact that the timeline almost just gives me much more motivation for the now mm. to take advantage of every opportunity that I had. Because you know the ball is going to stop bouncing at some point. Um, I just don't think it's any time soon.